Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 133, Rollin', talking dice trays and towers. I'm Sean, with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Remember, we record live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. All right, tonight, I'm not going to dig into why, but I decided I am going to dive as deep as I could into our question bowl, fish around and see what I can find at the very bottom of the bowl. And I pulled out the oldest question we have, which happened to be about dice trays and dice towers. So we'll be sharing our thoughts on these dice rolling tools in our Ask the Bellhop segment. Well, that will probably be a fairly short topic, though I'm not sure. We left it pretty unscripted. I've got a longer than usual RPG review today where I'm going to be deep diving Magical Kitties Save the Day. This is a family friendly RPG from Atlas Games. And then we'll be wrapping up with our usual Bellhops tabletop segment where we do a week, week in review. And I've got initial thoughts on the Aventuria adventure card game and a very cool demo kit for it. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Our first comment comes from our Rainy Day AMA, where one of our topics was frustrations <laughs> and difficulties playtesting games. Todd Zercher writes, I've seen a lot more prototyping happening on Tabletop Simulator. This has the advantage of online play and can add nicer graphics without having to go to the time and expense of making a hard copy of the game. Better looking, cheaper, and easier to update. All good things for designers out there. Well, thanks for the comment, Todd. Um, while I do agree, this is a great option for creating a prototype copy of a game and definitely way cheaper than going through GameCraft or making something of your own. I just don't know if it'll help you find people to play test the game much. That was actually the main question was, why is it I can't find anyone to play test my games from uh, local Windsor designer, Robert Moash? And I don't know, because he did it. He went on Tabletop Simulator and he made it on Tabletop Topia. And now I got to say, well, a lot of people are in lockdown or isolation still, though more people are getting out, which is good to see. Um, digital tabletops are really popular right now. So there are tons of people using them. But I have a feeling that once things open up, people are going to swap back to physical gaming pretty quickly. Now, where Tabletop Simulator and Tabletopia or any other digital implementation really does help, though, is being able to play test with people who aren't local. And again, that same local designer, it ends up the best playtesting he's done is actually from a design group out of Seattle. And they are using Tabletopia to be able to play each other's games. Well, next, a comment on our Invid Invasion review from the same episode, number 130. Meandering Meeple wrote, Your review on the podcast was so compelling, I ordered this straight after listening. Love Robotech, the new generation. You hear that, Solar Flare Games? <laughs> well, thanks, Meandering Meeple. I, I love hearing about people discovering new games through our show. As a Robotech fan, I think you're going to really enjoy this one. Uh, of the three I tried, this was definitely the one that felt the most like Robotech. And if New Generation is your favorite series, this is the best game of the bunch. What I'd love to hear is how it went once you get a copy. All right, well, next up, Martin Voss commented on our next step train games from Ticket to Ride topic of last week. They wrote, with grandpa and the kids, I break out 18XX. Recently introduced my son to 18EU, and he loves it even more than Steam over Holland. He couldn't sleep because of how much he was thinking about it. Wow, thanks for the comment, Martin. Um, while I've enjoyed my limited 18XX experiences, I, there's no way I would consider anything I've played in that realm a next step game, unless it's a next step from, say, Age of Steam or German Railroads or something other heavy to start with. Now, I have said before, though, that I think what I need, and I think in general that that particular genre of games needs, is someone to sit down and teach you how to play. Instead of trying to learn from, in my case, the 1830 rule books uh, uh, from Mayfair Games with uh, their whole C section 3.6.8 subsection this and all the, the truncated words. And oh, it's, it's like trying to go back to math class or something. Now, I'm guessing that's what's happening here. That or we've got the whole, yeah, I taught my kid power grid at age five. Maybe that's what's happening too. And if you did, great job. Uh, Martin's an 18XX pro. 
and he has found a way to teach the game to make it more accessible. And congratulations for that. If you can distill it down so that the kids and grandpa can understand it, all the power to you. Now, if that is the case, Martin, when are you coming to Windsor? Because, you know, anytime 2023, give it another year. But I would love to learn how to play those games. Well, sticking with the same topic of train games to follow up Ticket to Ride, Penguin Sushi wrote, My wife loves, loved Ticket to Ride. We have five or six versions of it. But then a few years ago, we moved to Iron Dragon and discovered that it has everything we liked about Ticket to Ride, but with a couple of more layers of complexity and interest on top. Mm. Haven't played Ticket to Ride much since. Well, thanks for the comment, Penguin Sushi. Uh, For those that don't know, Iron Dragon is actually one of the Empire Builder-based Crayon Rail games. Uh, This one with a fantasy theme. So we did have Crayon Rails in general on our list as next step games. So you're right with you there. Uh, This isn't one I played. To be honest, I've admitted it before. I haven't actually played Empire Builder either. But I am really curious about this one because it has elves and dwarves and dragons. And I wonder how that actually impacts a crayon rail game, like what what impact that has in the game. I was taking a look at it on Board Game Geek actually before posting this comment. I'm like, it's definitely an older game, like one of the old Mayfair games where it's like tons of little poker chips with stickers on them. So I don't think that one's been updated in a while, but I'm really curious to know how how they've managed to mesh fantasy with rails. All right, well, our final comment comes from Theodore Bent, who commented on our Magical Kitties Save the Day unboxing video not long after it went live on Monday. Theodore wrote, Every human has a problem. Well, if that isn't the most honest intro to a game I've (laughs) ever heard, I don't know what would be. This sounds awesome. Well, thanks for the comment, Theodore. Um, I got to say, I've been excited to try Magical Kitty Save the Day ever since I first heard about this game. Now, I finally did get to do that just this past week, and you and everyone listening should stick around for the review segment later in the show to find out how it went. That's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. Um... One quick announcement before we continue to our main topic. Those of you here live, you have one week left to enter our Ticket to Ride digital giveaway. Now, for those of you watching on YouTube or listening to the podcast or catching this video on demand somehow, you got less time than that. For those that missed the announcement last week, we're offering up a Steam key for Ticket to Ride from Asmodee Digital. The contest is open worldwide. To enter, just head over to the blog and find the Ticket to Ride Steam Key giveaway post. There is a link under Tabletop Gaming Deals on our top menu, or just throw follow the link we'll toss in the show notes or the one that Deanna just dropped in chat. Good luck. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Tonight, we've got a topic from longtime fan of the show, Emmett O'Brien, who writes, Anyone here use dice trays for rolling? My wife wants me to make some for the group. My question is, is there a difference in usability or transportability in the different sizes and shapes of trays? <laughs> I've seen square and hexagon trays. My brother-in-law has a narrow tray that seems like it would be easier to transport. What's the difference? For a follow-up question, is the added bulk of a dice tower worth it? Well, thanks for the question there, Emmett. Um, let's start off with dice trays, since that's the first thing Emmett brings up here. And I guess it, it's, it's good to hear Emmett again. Um, yes, I use them, but not often. I, I have, I don't know, mixed thoughts on whether or not dice trays are worth it. And a lot of it has to do with exactly what you're playing and where you're playing. Like in general, the average board game, I don't think you need them. The average role-playing game where you've just got like a small handful of dice, you don't really need them. But when I've got a big pool of dice, that's where I want something to corral them so they don't end up all over the table. Basically, the bigger the pool, the more I want one. Now, an example of one of the first games that I started using a dice tray with was Sorcerer. Uh, Sorcerer is a dual, excuse me. Sorcerer is a dueling card game from Wise Wizard Games where you can end up rolling a ton of dice and checking for damage. 
and that was great to keep it in one place. And actually the game suggests you use the box lid to do this. So like they, they knew it themselves, but the box lids big and takes up a lot of room and you got to kind of peek to look in. And I found the dice tray bigger. Another one that I always use my dice tray for is big trouble in little China. Um, not for the player dice because you don't roll enough of your own dice, but for the damage and attack dice. And that's great because uh, my particular tray actually has a staging area and you just put all the dice in the staging area and you can pass the tray around and people can pick them out of the staging area and roll what they want. And, and then you can kind of show everyone what they've got. Now, most recently, um, I just shared the picture of this on Instagram, was Robotech Invid Invasion, which we reviewed a couple weeks ago. Uh, one point during the second phase, you are dealing with dice pools of up to 15 dice. And if you use all of those on one attack, that's a lot of dice. Now, on the RPG side, I don't use them for D&D, right? There's just not enough dice. Although I know with advantage, at least maybe now you're rolling two D20s a little more often. But in general, you're rolling a D20 and a damage die, and, and that's about it. But I would definitely use one for Shadowrun. Um, the Alien RPG is another big dice pool game. But another one that uses dice pools is Magical Kitties, which we'll be talking about later. But your biggest dice pool is six. Six dice is kind of borderline to me. Two or three, I don't bother. Now, where I do like having the dice tray is if I'm not playing at home. So if I'm going to go to the local game store, it's a good way to transport the dice I need so I can throw them in the dice the, the dice tray and just bring that with me. And it's a way to, you know, keep my dice corralled. At a game store, I'm more worried about stuff going on the floor and stuff getting mixed in with other people's dice and things like that than I am at home. So it's a good way to corral things. I also always use one when using any metal dice sets. Now, these are becoming really popular lately. There are tons out there. The ones I have are a little older. They're actually 3D printed on Shapeways, but they have some really sharp edges. And I don't want to damage my game table. So I make sure to always use one of those. Um, the other thing is for live streaming. They're great because they keep the dice in one spot. The other thing about live streaming is you don't want dice noise. The dice noise just isn't fun mm. on microphones uh, and it can get weird with noise cancellation things. So uh, for me, I haven't really used one much other than Sorcerer. The, I, was, I played Sorcerer yep. with you guys and the dice tray, but I did decide that I wanted one. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. that was a month before or before the pandemic because it was specifically for the next con we were about to be going mm -hmm. to. Con games, I think, are a great place to have a dice tray and just to keep whatever dice you're using right there in front of you. And if someone else wants to grab them, that's fine. But you've got, you know, a nice little thing to carry around and, and keep contained on a table mm -hmm. with, with a bunch of people. And you, you don't have to worry about dice skittering off. And, and you know, what, what are the rules at this table about dice on the floor yeah. or whatever? It's just a lot more convenient in a con setting, again, away from home, just like at the mm -hmm. FLGS. So that's a bit about what I think of Dice Towers, what Sean thinks of Dice Towers. What I want to do now dice trays. is <laughs> Dice Trays, sorry, Ooh, jumping ahead. Dice Trays, what I think about Dice Trays, what Sean thinks about Dice Trays. What I'd like to do is kind of come up with a list, like brainstorm a bunch of reasons why you might want a Dice Tray. And yes, this is going to repeat some of the stuff we just said, but I wanted to kind of get out of the way what, why I would use one. And whereas this, I'm going to mention things that I may not be the reason I want them, but it might be reasons people have told me over the years or other benefits I've seen for using dice trays. So I'm going to start off with, as I said, huge dice pool. So, so just maintaining large numbers of dice, a whole bunch of stuff at once. So that if you're rolling lots of dice, it's just way better to keep them in one place and corral them. Absolutely. And then similarly, if even if you don't have a lot of dice, if you've got a lot of stuff on the table, you don't want to be knocking those miniatures mm -hmm. that are, that are, you know, You've just spent 15 minutes making sure you've got line of sight to the orc party. You don't want to knock that miniature off and mess things up. Yeah, or if you paint your miniatures or you convert them or you build your own scenery, you don't want your dice knocking stuff over and banging into things. Now, I mentioned sharing dice in um, Big Trouble in Little China, and that is a huge reason that I use dice trays. And actually, the first dice tray I ever used, I picked up at Value Village. And it was actually this rattan lid probably for like um, a rice steamer or something, but it just looked kind of neat and old and beat up and well, medieval, quote unquote. And I bought that because I'm like, oh, this will be great for Warhammer because Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 3rd Edition specifically uses unique narrative dice that only come with that game. And my players, I wasn't going to force my players to go buy their own dice. 
So I made sure to have at least one set and I bought a spare set to mix them together. And we shared the dice for that whole game. I know there's some RPG gamers out there cringing about sharing dice, but that's what we did. If anyone wanted to buy their own set, they could. And actually one of my friends, I think did, I think Steve did buy his own set. But anyway, what we found was such a pain was here, pass this, pass that, pass this, pass that, pass me these dice. Whereas we kept all the dice in the dice tray. We passed over the person. They took out the ones they needed. They rolled them. Then they put all the dice back in the tray and they pass off to the next person. We also did that with fancy flight game Star Wars for the same reason. And as I said, we did it for, um, Big Trouble in Little China. I've done it for Marvel heroic role playing. Being able to share a shared set of dice, a dice tray is a great way to move those around without having to like pass around thing, big things of dice. Now, on the opposite side, they're also awesome for the exact opposite reason, <laughs> which is the reason I generally was considering, which is for that con game when everyone has their own favorite dice, everyone loves their dice and wants their dice to roll for them, which is to a totally RPG thing, but yep. it allows you to keep that all together. And especially in games like fake games or something like that, where you may have a lot of dice that are the same, you mm -hmm. don't have to worry about mixing them all up. You've got your dice in your tray. And then actually it's something I hadn't thought of originally, but during a pandemic, you don't want to share dice. That's a good way to keep your stuff and your six foot or <laughs> is it six foot now, two meter, two meter, keep your two meter space. You're, you're six feet apart. If you happen to be gaming, wear your mask and keep your dice in your tray. There you go. Uh, the other thing, um, like I said, I've used mine for is this, is they're actually a good way to store and transport dice. Now, this doesn't apply to the average RPG gamer who owns 40 sets of dice, but for uh, board games or, or things as smaller sets of dice, it's a great way to do it. So, for example, when I was running Mouse Guard, I made sure just toss all the, because again, Mouse Guard's a game with unique dice. I toss them all in the dice tray, and then I just pack that with the game, and I bring it over to the local game store, and there's all the Mouse Guard dice there. Now, that depends on the type. A lot of people are going to have the standard sort of fold, fold flat type where you're going to transport that separately from the dice. You can't keep dice in it. But if you do have the lidded type, they yeah. are fantastic for uh, for transporting. Yeah, and obviously that has a, has a different bonus, which we'll get to in a minute, because that's on there to mention. Yep. Uh, the other thing is you want a soft surface. Uh, it's a soft surface, which is going to be better for metal and gemstone dice. This is a heads up for anyone. You see those super expensive gemstone dice? Yes, they look so beautiful. They cost $90. You buy them. You roll them once on your game table, they'll probably break. But more importantly, never let them hit each other. That is what I've learned about gemstone dice. Thankfully, not by personal habit. Uh, I don't have the money to buy dice that cost that much. But for those that can, one at a time. Roll one gemstone die at a time. Even in the softest tray you've got, if the two dice hit each other, they will chip. So, yeah, just a soft surface. It's, it's something better than rolling on wood or whatever the game table you're on or even plastic. It's going to be quieter. It's going to be more pleasant. And you're not going to damage your dice. Now, the other thing, going back to these RPG people and all these crazy <laughs> ideas they have, there are 100% a lot of RPG people out there who are superstitious about their dice. Mm -hmm. If I don't roll this dice first and this dice second, it won't work. If I don't roll them into my dice tray, it won't work. If, I, if it rolls off the table, I'm going to get another dice and replace it and never use that die again. Yep. Whatever the superstition is, RPG gamers have a lot of them because statistics are hard. So <laughs> dice are very magical to a lot of people and we live our lives with them. And it's, it's just something that just comes naturally, even though we know in most cases it's utterly silly. Yep. Most dice really aren't that expensive unless you're buying the steel and gemstone ones. Well, yeah. And so if you have to replace them every time it hits the floor, so be it. Yeah, that, that's that's totally fair. And here's what, another one is um, dice trays help prevent rule disputes. When a die rolls on the floor, what happens? Do you pick it up and you count the number or do you re-roll? What if it rolls cocked on the edge or what if it bounces off something? I know people that are like, they roll their dice on the table and if they hit anything, that's not a valid roll. It hit something. I'll notice most of those seem to be failing their rolls at this time, but we'll leave that apart or for later. So one of the things the dice tray does is has a boundary. So when you roll, it's really simple. If it doesn't land in the tray, it doesn't count. It doesn't matter how it landed, where it landed. And yes, you can technically have a die land cocked in a tray, but it's a lot less common than when you're rolling on your books and an uneven surface and your battle mat or whatever else is out there. Right. 
Now, again, we mentioned this before, but live streams, mm -hmm. aside from a softer surface, so you're not having as much of a, you know, dice on table noise for the mics to pick up. You've also got them in a limited space. So if you want to put that overhead camera in a place to see where the dice are rolling on mm -hmm. camera, you know exactly where those dice are going to roll because yep. you've got your dice tray, tray there. And even then, what we've done on streams, too, is dice trays usually aren't very slippery, right? Like the surface is is um, textured in a way. The dice won't move around much. So you can often like, hey, pass me the tray and hold it up to the camera without changing the results on the dice. There's no way you could do that without a dice tray of some sort, right? Like the dice are on the table. You could pick up each individual one, show it to a camera. And to be honest, that was the reason I got the fancy dice tray I have <laughs> was actually to use it on live streams. But I do use it quite often. So... Some people will claim that dice trays include randomness. Now, I haven't seen any official studies that seem to actually prove this, but I know people who swear that rolling on a tray is more random than rolling on a table. Though, honestly, if you're really worried about that randomness factor and making sure the dice are random, you probably want to look at a dice tower, which we'll get to in a bit. Yeah, there's, there's people have ways of rolling dice. Uh, and I freely admit, I am a person who tries not to look at how people roll their dice because it bothers me if I see people roll in certain ways. Um, but it is, it may be a fact that people are generally a little bit more vigorous when rolling mm -hmm. into a dice tray because they don't have to worry about skittering off the table. Uh, mm -hmm. And that extra bit of force helps them bounce around a little more. Whether it's any yeah. more random, maybe not. Yeah. But it's not just dropping them out of your hands neatly onto the table. Yeah. So a well-designed die, even dropping it from like half a foot is going to bounce enough that it's, if it's properly balanced, it's going to work. Um, there was something I was going to say and I lost it. So I was thinking about the, the, I've seen people do some interesting, yeah. <laughs> oh, backspin. Me, me, if I'm rolling, I, I, I'm all about the backspin. You roll the D20 kind of like this, so it bounces <laughs> forward and rolls back to you. That's a little harder to do with the dice tower. Um, but the other thing that the trays do to increase randomness is by having sides, right? So there's something for the dice to bounce off of. And this is the reason that if you go play craps at a casino, you have to roll the dice hard enough that they bounce off the back wall. And that, you get that, in a smaller scale in a dice tray right so do you have anything else uh, those were some rough ones i kind of noted down ahead of time plus a couple i came up with as we were going the reasons people might want a dice tray now what we will be doing is after the main topic we'll jump into into the lobby because i do see some nice comments in there and i'd love to see those keep flowing so if you've got more to say on the topic in the lobby please go go right ahead and we'll jump in after we get through our thoughts on the topic not no. that we're trying to sound better than you or anything, but no, I think really realistically, it, it's that you know the containment, the noise, and the safety, uh, yeah. and and so we didn't actually we we, right we didn't mention noise in this list. We mentioned it when we were talking about our stuff. So yes, it reduces noise if you get the right kind of dice tray, <laughs> which is something we'll get to in a minute. Where I start talking about things you want to look for in a dice tray, because I have seen some dice trays that are definitely louder than normal. But yeah, a padded tray, getting a padded tray to reduce the noise is good. A um, couple other things that I think I will toss in here is one, they can look pretty. They're, they're a cool piece of gamer swag. You can get them with logos on them or whatever your, your favorite house or your army's logo or your orc war face or whatever, whatever you want, or just generic cool looking things. Um, you can get them in various colors. So again, if you collect an army or if there's a certain color you prefer or your character carries a tabard um, you can get them with thematic shapes. Uh, though those are a little more rare and well, again, might get into the advantages, disadvantages into a bit of shape. Um, but they're just a cool thing. They're a cool piece of, they're, they're a cool tchotchke, right? There's something neat to have. Yeah. And, uh, and if you really want to be boring like me, you can get one that's just completely plain black and shows off the dice nicely without there showing itself off as a, uh, as a feature. It's a good point. All right. So let's flip things around. Uh, What's what are the disadvantages? Like, what, what? Why wouldn't you want to use a dice tray? Look at all these awesome things we just thought of. That are great reasons to have dice trays. Well, why wouldn't you want a dice tray? Well, for one thing, it's something else. As a gamer, you're already carrying a bunch of stuff. Whether mm -hmm. it's dice, pencils, papers, books, uh, your tablet, whatever you need, whatever it is you're carrying, whether it's board games or RPGs, you are carrying a bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. And having a dice tray. It's just one more thing you have to worry about remembering to bring and remembering to bring home again. Yeah. 
even at home, it's just still something else you got to go get from wherever it's stored. And you put, and we were talking about um, putting specific dice in the game. Well, if you play multiple different games, you got to take the dice out, you got to put them away at the end of the game, and you got to put the dice for the next game you want to play in it. So it's definitely a thing. The other thing is they take up room. Um, you may have limited space, a, a dice trays in general are not very well done to stack on a shelf with a bunch of board games you know you can't get a ticket drive box that way well, you probably could but the average dice tower is this like i've got i should have actually kept mine so i can hold it it's behind me here but it, like quite thick and takes up some space um which sometimes space is at a premium though of course there are some options regarding that which we'll get into more but which sean just held up as well also they can also just make dice harder to see so depending mm -hmm. on the size of your table and the size of your dice tray and the depth of your dice tray, uh, if you want to be able to see other people's rolls, uh, there are people who may not be as trustworthy or you just may be relying on seeing dice, seeing other people's rolls to calculate. If you're the DM, you may need to be thinking ahead based mm -hmm. on what that person's rolling and it can just be harder to see if it's sitting in the middle of a dice tray or if it's up against the wall closest to you, you mm -hmm. can't peer down over the edge. I, it can just make things that much more difficult to see what's going on unless mm -hmm. you've got a camera mounted directly over top of it. But even then you got to be able to see the video from that camera somewhere projected and not just shown on your stream. <laughs> so that's another part of it. Um, dice trays can be loud. Like Sean's saying they're great for quieting things, but like I'm thinking back to that first wooden one I told you about with like bamboo on it. Oh my gosh. Like it was actual rattan on the back and you rolled into that. And it was like clack, 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 which to be honest, we kind of liked but <laughs> at first, but it does get annoying. Uh, worst ones are terrible uh, without some form of padding. Um, a metal, I've seen a metal dice tray before, which I was kind of like, okay, but I guess someone thought it was neat. It looked, it was an ammo case, right? It was, a, it was, it was someone who liked, you know, Cyberpunk, Shadow Run, Gun Bunny kind of thing. And they had this converted ammo case. And, but oh my gosh. But they're like, oh, it sounds like gunfire. Well, I'll teach your own. But I thought it was a little annoying. But the thing is, who cares if it's in your basement? Right. Unless you got sleeping kids, it's not a big deal. But think of the other people around you, especially if you're going out to a local play event. You don't want everyone to be able to hear every role you make during your game. Now, I think one of the big problems with them that a lot of people see, and one of the reasons I didn't have one for a long time, is they cost money. Mm -hmm. Everything in this hobby costs money. And if you're board gaming, you've got a box lid or there's a perfectly good table you're role playing at that you can roll on. As long as you're careful, the dice will stay on the table. Yep. You don't need a dice tray. Nope. Yeah. You could always use the money, buy more games. That's what I generally <laughs> rather have is more games than a dice tray, to be honest. And another reason that, that dice trays can be a problem is they can distract from other things like you're like oh look at the dice tray and people are going to focus on that but that's more new when you first bring it out but i like the first time i brought a dice tray out to an rpg group we wasted half an hour of people throwing their dice in the dang dice tray and i'm like come on yeah. but in general i you just don't need them like 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 the, there's perfectly good other ways to roll. And the biggest one, like Sean said, grab the box lid, right? Like flip the lid over. Now, to be honest, I actually do the, the with it. I, I take my dice tray and I use the lid of my dice tray as a separate dice roller because it's even more padded than the felt bottom. It's actually kind of squishy. And that's the one I like to use for my metal dice. But I've used dice box lids for years. That's what we use for Warhammer. So Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 3rd Edition has these little character boxes. And before I bought the wooden big thing, which I should have brought upstairs, we still have it. That would have been perfect for the backdrop. Um, we just passed around one of the lids for one of the, the character boxes and we use that. It worked good, but it, the lip was a little high and you had to kind of lean in to see it. And to be fair, I bought this for role playing at cons, but I've never used a dice tray at cons before. Yeah. I just wanted one moving forward. Uh, right. Again, I didn't need one, but it was something that as I was starting to, uh, I wish <sighs> Sorry, I uh, wish I was going to more cons. Yeah, um, I, I thought it was something that I was finally going to just kind of penny up and, and, and have around uh, mm -hmm. for the con tables. Oh, that's fair. I, I probably should pack that dice tray for cons. So I haven't yet, um, but that's a good idea, especially a good way to keep your dice as long as, as long as I have a way to carry it. Like I don't want to walk around with the thing in my hand the whole time, whereas right. yours is flat. You can throw it in a bag a lot easier than I yeah, can. Yeah, exactly. Mine will fit into a book almost you know, basically yeah. as a bookmark. All right, that's that's what we got for why you might want dice trays and why you may not. Let's assume you do want one. 
All right. So you're going to go buy your dice tray. What do you think you want to get? Because there are all kinds of dice trays out there. I've, I've seen wood. I've seen lined wood, plastic. I've seen square ones, hexagonal ones, round ones, um, something made out of silicon, PU leathers, popular folding ones, magnetic ones, snap together ones. And as I said, converted ammo box ones. Um, just like the place I see these all the time is I spend quite a bit of time on Etsy because there are some amazing tabletop crafters out there making awesome things to upgrade your games. And dice trays are one of the most popular items. Almost Not every shop, but like it feels like 25% of the shops I go to for one thing or another also sell dice trays and dice towers. So you're going to find a huge range of handmade for it and made trays. Now, along with that, there are a number of companies out there that now specialize in made dice trays. Now, personally, I'm going to shout out Easy Roller Dice because they gave me my favorite tray back there. And I'm not just saying that because they gave it to me to show off their stuff. It's really nice. Like, it is fantastic. I love this dice tray. And like, there's Easy Roller, there's other companies, and Amazon's just filled with them. If you go on Amazon and search for dice tray, you're going to find snap together, fold together, hexagonal square, and so on. Yeah. And one thing you can also really find in the handmade trays are dice trays that aren't just a dice tray. And this mm -hmm. may help, uh, you know, help you make your decision. So if you're a digital RPGer, if you're an RPGer who's got their tablet, you can probably find a mm -hmm. dice tray with a tablet stand built right into it. Yeah. Yeah, there's all kinds of stuff like that, right? Where where it's like a character card holder with dice tray and yeah. things like that for all kinds of... I was almost in the Gloomhaven. There's no dice in Gloomhaven. <laughs> Gloomhaven popped to my... Uh, Zombicide, there's one I've seen where it's Zombicide yeah. character trays with extra dice. So this is what I think you don't want. Now, this is generic, right? This is what I wouldn't want. We'll go that way. This is what I wouldn't want. And I think it's going to apply to most people. But there are probably people out there that will want some of these features. But in general, but I'm going to go into why. So... I mentioned them earlier, handmade wooden trays. Um, these are all over Etsy. They're usually really striking. They're usually made of beautiful woods that are treated and uh, what do you call that when you varnished or whatever they do, mm -hmm. dyed and varnished. And then they have awesome artwork for the bottom, right? Like the bottom of the tray will feature all kinds of stuff. Whatever you're into, you can find it. These all look great. But there's a couple things, and I've seen it mainly in reviews, and I've seen it happen to a local friend who's bought one of these, is that the rolling especially using metal dice has damaged that art and there's the problem we mentioned earlier about how loud they are dice rolling onto like, like it's worse than a table a table like you know i don't know how i don't know the physics of it but it's a big piece of wood versus smaller piece of wood echoes more or less so these also are you don't want to use your gemstone dice on them because they're hard surfaces. Your metal dice are probably going to damage the trays. Um, now, what there is out there, and I've seen many of these, are wooden trays with a felt bottom. That's better. But then many of these use like thin felt that I've seen it where the felt starts peeling up and coming apart. And then many of them don't have felt on the sides. So while it's quiet rolling into it, it's still bouncing off wooden edges. So you still have dice hitting wood. Yeah, and sometimes it's not even actually felt. It's actually just like a flocking. Yeah. And that's where you're going to start getting the wear and tear on them. And you're just not, it's not going to last as a soundproof surface. The noise will build slowly and yeah. slowly the longer you use it. Yeah, and if they lacquer that bottom so you don't damage it, that's got that lacquer clacker yeah, yeah. sound. <laughs> yeah, that higher pitched, the higher pitched clack to it. Yes, exactly. So I'm like, how do I describe dice sounds? <laughs> Uh, the other thing, and many of these wood ones are like this, is I don't like square trays. I see lots of square trays out there, um, many of them being the handmade kind, but I also see them often made from laser cut wood. You can get them from places that also do like wooden box inserts and stuff, and they'll feature like metal um, magnets or whatever to put them together. And they look great, but the dice... The corners are bad, like little edgy corners. Dice don't bounce out of corners. They tend to get stuck in there. And sometimes it can actually be hard to get the dice out, like just for scooping out the dice once you want to roll again. You don't want to have to pick up the whole tray and dump it out in your hand. And actually, I said square, but I guess any rectangular tray, anything that has corners isn't something I would want. Now, one of the, the, one, the one exception, I think, is, and there's a bunch of these on Etsy, are books. So essentially people have taken books or, or, or mm. made fake books books, and you open up the books and that holds your dice and, yes. and those, those can be gorgeous. And for something that pretty and, and that sort of decorative, I will sacrifice a little bit of the, having those corners, 
But in general, if you're just having a dice tray for the purposes mm-hmm. of being a dice tray, no, you don't want 90 degree corners. See, even the books, though, I've seen good ones where they just put a little piece of wood in the corners. Right. So you're you're just taking that little edge out, right? So that the actual inside of the book is an elongated hexagon, I right. guess. <laughs> I'm like failing for words here right. to describe what I'm talking about. No, no 90 degree corners. That's what we're, no we're 90 trying to angles. avoid 90 yes. degree corners. And, well, anything more acute than that, too, is probably also bad. Yeah. All right. You don't want anything heavy. Uh, this is another problem with trays made of real wood. Real wood can be heavy, uh, though, depending on the wood. There is some real wood that's light. And then more so the hardware used to assemble them, right? Like someone had to put these together. Maybe they use glue and that'd be pretty light, but often they use some kind of set screws or brackets or whatever to put them together. Uh, the book Sean's mentioning, they usually have some kind of clasp and a hinge. All of that weighs much, weighs more. And now if you only play at home, it's not a big deal. You're just grabbing it off your shelf. You're putting it on the table. But if you're transporting it, like I'm not going to want to carry around what looks like a big sorcerer's tome filled with miniatures and dice around a con. Although unless it's part of like a cosplay prop, maybe. But even then, I'd rather carry a big foam book around as a prop than a big chunk of wood with a bunch of stuff stuck inside it. Yeah, there, there's a lot of super decorative one, like yes. necromancer dice trays or mm-hmm. dungeon dice trays. And these are gorgeous if you're sitting in it, if you're putting it on your big game table at home, but these are not something you're ever going to want to transport anywhere. Right. For one thing, you you might damage it. Like these mm-hmm. are usually nice enough that transporting them around is going to make you nervous yeah. of damaging it or, you know, having someone play with it too roughly at the FLGS. Yep. And though I hate to admit it, those are also the kind of things that tend to go missing at game conventions. Same for any dice tray, actually. So that is something. Keep your eye on your tray, especially if you stuff it with your dice. Um, you don't want a big too, tray that's too big. Now, uh, and this is so based on the kind of games you play. Uh, these are going to be great for games with tons of dice, but like you don't need a ton of room to roll a lot of dice. Big trays are heavier. They're harder to transport. They're harder to store. You don't really need anything bigger. I don't know. What are they a foot? Like, what's that standard size? Like the size you have? That's about a foot. I'm thinking. Uh, I, I, like that even. seems to have become yeah, kind of a, a you know, standard. Ten, 10 inches, probably. I think. Yeah, something like like that. You definitely. You don't even need that big. I don't think. But that's good for a, a nice tr- area. Um, which actually, I'll just throw it in right now. You also don't want anything too small. <laughs> I have seen these really tiny little dice trays. Um, again, mostly on Etsy. Oh, um, that are great for like maybe rolling a single d20. And they tend to come with these sets. It's like got a spot, a stand for your miniature and a spot to put your pencil. And you have this little, little like bowl to roll into. And I'm like, yeah, maybe that's great for a D20 game or something or a D100 game or on 2D10 and that's it. But like, that's going to be completely useless if you're playing most board games where you roll more than a couple dice. Yeah, I mean, and even if you are playing something like Shadowrun and you've got, you know, a, a 15 or a 20 dice pool, you only need enough space for the dice to all lay flat on and not, you know, stack on top of each other. If the dice are bouncing off of each other when you roll, that's fine. That's just adding to the yep. randomness. Which actually, I don't have that in here. We, we could possibly talk about a whole uh, dice tray etiquette that is important. Roll all your dice at once. Don't roll some, then roll other dice into them and try to hit the dice already there to get them to roll better. That is not cool. If you enjoy that, go buy the game Strike from Ravensburger and just play that because that's what it's all about. Don't do that during my game. That's just ridiculous trying to fix your own dice rolls. There, one one, one dice tray etiquette tip. There you go. That drives me nuts. I've seen people do it and I'm just like, come on. Like, like you may as well just set the die to whatever side and tell me a number because there's no <laughs> point in what you're doing. Um, I don't like the the floppy silicon. Again, I'm, my vocabulary is terrible for this episode, I guess. But I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but like the, the type, like muffin tin type and the type that people often buy for bowls uh, for component control during a board game, right? They, they're, they're usually so the muffin tins or, or sorry, muffin cups or snap together trays. And they sell these for like putting your keys in when you get home from work too. The problem I find with these is they're too floopy. Like like the dice are heavier than the material. So you'll roll a die and it'll basically just kind of roll over the edge. And like, or the whole tray will tip up as soon as a die hits it. Now these are great, like for, for components, like if you want to play Terraforming Mars, you put all your cubes in one or whatever game you're playing. I don't know why particularly that one came up. Grab silicon trays, like a component 
but don't use those for rolling your dice in. Yeah, no, you, if the whole purpose of a dice tray is to contain your dice. Mm. So if it fails in that one basic task <laughs> above all else, it's not the right tool. And with that, if you've got di a dice tray that's either too deep and you can't see your dice or too mm -hmm. shallow and you bounce over the edges every time, again, it's not doing the one job it's there to do. Yes. Now, too deep, you can argue, but it, no one wants to be standing up and craning over oh. to stare at the dice every time. You want to be able to look at it as easy as if you rolled it just in front of you. Yeah, if you're getting too deep, you might as well use a box top at that point. There you go. As far as I'm concerned. All right, things... I would actually look for in a dice tray. Now that we got some stuff we, we, we're not interested in, we don't like, we think have issues, this is the kind of stuff I'm looking for. This is what I want. Uh, most importantly, no, I, I think Sean's got the most important point. What he just said. So I, I'll, I'll let him reiterate it after this. Second, the second most important thing is a surface that'll protect your dice. I want it to be padded or PU leather or have leather bottom, velvet lined, whatever it is. I want that and I want the entire surface covered, not just the bottom. I want the edges to have some type of protection as well, because there's no point in trying to protect my dice from here if they're going to bounce off the walls, which are hard. So first off, though, hold the dice. Keep yeah. the dice inside. If it doesn't do the one thing, which is a, be a place for the dice to roll in and stay in to show and mm -hmm. keep your dice in, there's no point in it. I prefer hexagonal. Uh, no corners. Well, there's edges, but they're, they're wide enough corners. The dice aren't going to hide in them and they're not going to get stuck in. Um, plus, actually, hexagonal is designed. So when the dice bounce off the whole angle of incidence equals angle of reflection, it tends to bounce them towards the middle of the tray. So they're usually grouped in the middle instead of on the edges. I am definitely a fan of the hexagonal. Um, I'm sure octagonal would actually work. I don't know why everything ended up hexagonal, like if, how that became the industry standard, but it seems like it is. I'm sure there's some geometry about the snaps that makes it easier for, for hexagonal. No, but like even mine that's not snaps is hexagonal. Okay. So uh, speaking of storing your dice, you may want to find a dice tray with a dice staging area. Now there's mm -hmm. a lot of these out there in various ways. Uh, Moe's got one with a rim around the outside mm -hmm. of the rolling area to store dice in. Some have separate containers off to the side. Some are divided in the tray. So a lot of the, a lot of the rectangular mm -hmm. ones, you've got a rolling area and a storing area. Uh, again, if you're going to have something that doesn't fl fold flat like mine for easy transport, you want something that's going mm -hmm. to store the dice as well. Yeah, so that, that's, a, that's another aspect to look at, right? You want something easy to transport. Basically, it's the same thing we said about box inserts. If it actually improves the game and makes it more useful and you're willing to do it, it's worth doing. So if anything you can do to get a dice tray you'll use is going to make it for a better dice tray, right? Versus a big heavy one or one you can't fit your bag or whatever. So you're looking at light, small enough that you can bring it anywhere and use it to store dice as well. So it's got that added functionality. You want something that's easy to use that you will actually use instead of just sitting on your shelf. And what's great for that are the ones like Sean has. Absolutely. Uh, actually, I actually just came across another one and I don't want to flaunt any shops, but it's a foam dice tray. So again, it's light. It's easy mm -hmm. to carry. It's soft for your dice. It's quiet for your dice. But the top of it, the top lid actually has pluck foam designed for dice. So you actually, okay. so it's got like a D20 shape and a D12 shape and D4 shape and D6 shape. So you actually flip your dice tray over and the, the lid of it has got spots for all the different, your different okay. dice type. And it's also a nice little dice tray. Oh, that's cool. I assume you'd carry it upside down so they don't slowly slide out. Yeah, but either if they do, it's a yeah. foam dice tray. So <laughs> Yeah, and then the dice trays that, that are everywhere now is the ones like Sean has, right? There are the collapsible, a way to make them flat. Um, there are ones that go together with magnets. There's ones that use snaps. There's ones that you, I've actually seen one where you actually roll around the outside of a dice tower. Right. And then it like magnetically attaches to it. Um, the most popular are the magnet and snap ones. Uh, there's even ones where there's like something done where the, with the, like the leather. So it kind of snaps into itself. Uh, those are great. The, you can find these ridiculously cheap if you shop around. Now, there are name brand ones that cost more, possibly better quality. I'm not going to judge, but like these are the kind of things that actually show up on sites like Wish 
like fairly regularly. Like you can, you can sometimes find these at ridiculously low prices. Now I'm going to guess you may be getting what you pay for, but you know what, if they're that cheap, maybe if they do wear, you buy another one. Yeah. Uh, I got mine. I got mine on Etsy uh, through one of the links you've shared, you shared yeah. on, uh, along the way. But again, it was, I'd, I'd have to go back and dig because see it what was, the price is. It, yeah. well, it was uh, before March of last year when oh, I purchased yeah. it. So well, yeah, honestly, while. the prices range like yeah. the, they're, they're all over the board. So shop around, um, make sure you check reviews, right? Especially you're looking at Etsy, read, scroll down, read the reviews, see what other people have said. So one of the things I do like, about the collapsible. And I know a friend who does this and they are cheap enough and he makes enough money, right? For him, it's affordable is he actually owns multiples and leaves them in the games that need them. So he actually has multiple board games that have multiple flat dice towers that sit on top of everything. So when you lift the box, first thing that's there is a dice tower or sorry, dice tray. And he color coded them, right? Like this game has a brown one because it's a Western theme. And this game has a yellow one because it's an Egyptian theme and it's in the desert and so on. So if you can find them that cheap, that's also another thing. And for RPG players, now I know you don't want to damage your nice core rule books, but like some of these, depending on the, what you got to watch for is the snaps and the magnets, right? How much those stick up. You might be able to just toss right in a rule book. Absolutely. Uh, All right. So, the last part of Emmett's question is about dice towers. Mm. Now, I know Mo's not a fan. No. Uh, you've gotten some over the years as promos and used them at cons. Uh, they seem a little unnecessary. Yeah. I, I Plus, they tend to be loud. I've never seen a padded dice tower, which is weird, actually, that no one's done that. But I've never seen a padded dice tower. They all click and clack and make lots of noise. And I think that's part of it, right? That's a, oh, listen, I'm rolling a die. Um, I personally think that um, towers should be saved for cubes. Um, and they should be able to trap stuff inside them, like Shogun and Wallenstein. And actually, there's a newer one. Oh, I can't remember the name of it. It's got a pirate theme where you drop stuff through the mast. And they're actually dice in this one. But again, they can get stuck. That's really cool. For this type of dice tower, you don't want stuff that'll get stuck. That'd be terrible. <laughs> Not at all. Uh, yeah, again, these are generally made to be noisy. Yes. Um, and that's an issue. But on the other side, with me, with my little quirk about watching people roll dice, you don't have to worry about that. A, a decently, even a half decently made dice tower, it's going to bounce around in there. You're guaranteed to have some level of randomness coming out. Yeah, so th that is one of the biggest beliefs about dice towers. They're more random. Again, I don't know. I don't know if I buy this one. A die rolled properly on the table should have an equal chance of ending on any side. That's the whole point of it being a die. A dice tower shouldn't increase the odds of this. But the, my, the, the problem is whether or not people are rolling properly on a table. Right, that's that's gets, always the question. <laughs> yeah, so, so I was going to say, if dice towers were more random, that's what you'd see at casinos instead of rolling the dice on a table, making it bounce off a wall. But yeah, the big thing that dice towers are for for people is to prevent cheating. Personally, I honestly think that if you think this is a problem at your table, you've got bigger problems than needing a dice tower. You need to fix the cheater. Like nowadays, there's no reason you need to game with someone who feels the need to cheat during a friendly game. But yes, dice towers, that is that is their, their big fix is they keep it random so no one can cheat. I just don't have people to cheat your game with, and you don't need a dice tower. Fair. Now, I will say, dice towers look awesome, right? So I, I got to go with that. My, my, the one I own, I still own, is a little meeple back there. It's cute. It's neat. But, like, I have seen some really cool-looking towers. Um, not only can they look cool, they can even be thematically tied into the games you're playing. So Wingspan from Elizabeth Hargrave is a perfect example of this where it comes with a dice tower that looks like a bird feeder or sorry, like a bird home, what do you know? Bird house. And I'm like, ah, oh, that's just really cool. It looks really neat. It looks pretty. And it's thematic, right? Like it kind of ties everything together. Now I've also seen ones, uh, dice trays that actually include, sorry, dice towers that include dice trays. I'm like, that's a nice touch where it's at the end. And I've seen medieval ones. I've seen cyberpunk ones. And one of the ones I'm going to mention is you should check out Broken Token because they actually have this thing where they basically made Rube Goldberg dice towers. And you can buy any number of them. They all stack and they all work together. Now, these are fancy. These are like, you know, one's a burning skull. And when it comes in, the skeletal hand catches the die and drops it into another hand and drops it into another hand and drops it at the bottom. And then you can attach it to another one that's all these steampunk gears. And when the die turns, it turns the gears and makes a clock turn on the front. Like, they are fantastic looking. Mouse but trap. I don't... <laughs> Mouse trap, yeah. the dice roller. 
Yeah, basically, right? I'm like, all right, they look cool. I'll, I'll give you that. I will totally give you that. Uh, so one thing is they can help things keep organized. So much yeah. like with a dice tray, uh, perhaps a dice tray may be better. But again, if you're if you're on a stream or something like that, if everyone drops it into the dice thing and it comes out and it's got a little tray at the bottom, again, you've got a nice place for cameras to pick it mm. up with. And, it, you know, everyone's doing the same thing, rolling the same way, the same place. Uh, it can be handy, handy for that. Yeah, and again, it's it's going to keep it all in one area and probably doesn't go all over the table. Though I have seen some dice towers that tend to shoot them dice across the table when you're done. So you might want to combine that with something. Now, another thing I do get out of dice towers is the dramatic effect that we can be given for using them, especially if you don't use it for every roll or if you play a game that doesn't have a lot of rolls. Like I've seen a dice tower at an RPG game where this the DM had this like evil looking dice tower, we'll just say, and they played most of the game rolling their dice on the table. But then all of a sudden when it's like, oh, the big dragon takes in a deep breath and he breathes and he drops the like 17 D6s into the tower before seeing what the results spread out on the table and everyone looking and counting them up. So I get it. That is really, I can I can understand the flourish, right? Like the people doing that, a big crucial role. Um, one great way to do this is, um, I don't think you can get it anymore but at one point Wizards of the Coast put out this deluxe DM screen for Dungeons and Dragons. I think we might have been playing fourth edition at the time when that came out. And it features two towers on the off the side of the front panel. And they're each dice towers. And tower one dropped the dice towards the players and power two dropped them towards the DM. So it was great for those big rolls, right? Like, oh, here comes the damage roll and drop it on the player side. And you're going to scare the heck out of your players if they're just doing something mundane and all of a sudden you drop a D20 in that DM side. So there is that dramatic flair that you can get from using dice towers. Absolutely. And again, we get back into the superstition issue that we had before. Uh, just like some people need to roll on in their dice tray, there may be people who need to roll in their dice tower. Uh, it goes against the concept of being more random. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you know what? Some people have the their quirks, and that's fine. As long as it's not distracting from the game, taking away from the experience for everyone at the table, let them use it. More power to them. Now, I do have what I honestly think is the most important, most valuable thing a dice tower could possibly do. Being an able-bodied white guy, I can roll my dice wherever the heck I want. But that is not necessarily true for everyone. Dice towers can be and make a game more accessible. They can be a way for someone who would have normally difficulty rolling dice, whether that's shaky hands, arthritis, or physical disability. It's a way to allow more people to play at the table. And this probably also applies to dice trays to, I think, a smaller amount, but I think it definitely applies to dice towers. And it's one of the things, there's the one reason I will never question anyone using a dice tower if it's for an a, a accessibility issue. Because, I mean, there's no reason you can't have a dice tower that where you preload the dice and that person with whichever disability just knocks them into the tower. Uh, yeah. If that's all the motion they're capable to of, that's great. They're still rolling their dice and they're still playing in the game. And yes. that's what's important. So it's going to be a shorter list than earlier. What I would look for in a dice tower. So according to everyone, now everyone being those people who like dice towers, the important thing, the most important aspect of a dice tower is the number of ramps it has, has to be at least three, and what angles they're placed at. There have to be three different angles, at least, according to the experts. The more ramps, the more different angles, the more random and better the dice tower is. Again, I, I don't know how much truth there is to that, but it is definitely a thing for dice tower fans. Uh, go on board Game Geek and look up dice towers. You will see lots of people, or just like... <sighs> Find an item page with a dice tower and check the comments section to see the people's, oh, this don't. dice tower is not random enough. Or don't, don't read the yeah. comments. <laughs> or don't. <laughs> so one of the other things, uh, and now this is this is this is a little uh, different, it, but portability can be mm. a, an important feature. Um, how loud, how fragile, how collapsible. Uh, if it's collapsible, how hard is it to set up again? If you, yeah. it, you know, if you, are you going to just, not bother oh i don't want to have to set that up today because mm -hmm. then i gotta put these six different ang ramps in at these six different angles i <laughs> i'm just gonna roll it on the table if yeah. it's if it's that again if it's not getting the game to the table what's the point even if it's yes. an rpg game <laughs> no honestly that's why i don't use that meeple 
that meeple is such a pain in the butt to put together and it's not very unless i glue it it's not very well assembled if you throw a die hard enough one of the um one one of the ramps will fall out and it's right. not an official dice tray because it only has two and they're both facing each other. <laughs> uh, so yeah, definitely. Um, the other thing to think of is, is will it damage my dice? Because as I said, I've never seen a padded dice tower. Or will you damage the tower? If I throw a bunch of big, chunky, heavy metal dice into one of the... I wouldn't want to do that with one of those broken token, awesome Rube Goldberg machine dice trays. They're just that thin... I, I Birch wood, I think it is. I always forget. I want. I used to think it's balsa wood. It's not. I think it's birch that all their inserts are made out of. You don't want to be throwing a spiky D4 into your birch wood awesome thing you paid a fortune for. Uh, which leads us to the next point. They cost money. So one of the things to look at is the cost. Right. Definitely, definitely. Um, again, unless it's an accessibility issue, they do range in value. This is a, a nice to have. It looks pretty on the table. Absolutely. Again, if if you're going for that dramatic effect, I mean, we've done many episodes about setting the mood. If you, mm -hmm. you know, if you're going to drop the lights and have the mood music on and have a dice tower with glowing red eyes that blows mm. smoke out every, you know, as dice every time you, you want to uh, attack the players, smoke. then great. But you don't need that. You can no. play the game at the kitchen table with all the lights on just yep. as well. Though so I got to say, I, I do like that not, we live in a day and age where LEDs are so common and you could have that. That is something that would have been so awesome back in the 80s. I would have loved it, but it would have had a real candle in it and <laughs> something bad would have happened. That's all I know. Well, I mean, and to be fair, they have dice trays that have mood lighting in them. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't doubt it, to be honest. So, I can totally see a strip of LED on the inside yeah, yeah, yeah. matching the color or making it a, what are you, a complimentary color to your dice. There you go. So I don't know. You, you got any other reasons? Like, like, personally, I think dice towers and their use of personal preference thing. Um, again, except accessibility issues, that may be a forced choice, um, which is awesome. Use them for that reason. Absolutely. Some people like them. And you know what? Honestly, if it makes someone feel better, to use a dice tray, we'll use it. I don't care. I'm personally probably not going to bring one out to a table, but if someone insists I use one, I might give them a side eye for a second, like, wait, you don't trust me, but I'll use it. That's fine. Um, it, it's just not the thing I'm probably going to get, unless I can, you know, find a copy of that DM screen I was talking about, because that thing's pretty awesome. Because <laughs> I do like the dramatic moment. I really do. Like, I, I want to bring out the, the 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 boss fight dice tower that I only use when rolling for Tiamat or something like that. Right. Where it, it has five different ways the dice can roll out randomly. And depending on what head it rolls out, that's the type of damage it does. So if it comes out the ice mouth, it's ice damage. And all oh, that sounds, now I want a Tiamat dice tower. So, so, Someone make a Tiamat dice tower and give it to me to review because I'm yeah. sure I won't be able to afford it. There we go. So again, I, again, it, if it's going to help you play, it's important. If it's going to get a game to the table or get you playing more often or playing mm -hmm. playing uh, more frequently or easier, yeah, that's great. If it's just something you want, if it's in your budget, awesome. But yeah. do take a look at some of the features we talked about and decide whether or not it's something that once you've spent that money on it, you're actually going to end up using on any regular basis. Yeah, so just jumping back to, to summarize, in general, I, we're basically fans of dice towers, or dice trays, sorry. We're, we're <laughs> fans of dice trays. Jumping back to the beginning, the start of the topic. We are fans of dice trays. I, I don't use them all the time, but they definitely serve a purpose. They're definitely useful. They definitely keep the dice corralled. We're not sharing dice. There's, there's lots of good reasons to have dice trays. I strongly recommend, uh, and not everyone needs one, but like, there's no reason not to, except for cost. If you can afford one, like like Emmett's like, should I get one? Should I make them for my friends? Definitely. Like your wife wants you wants to make dice towers, give them out to your players. That is awesome. Now I know you said the rectangular might be better. What I would do is find a pattern for one of those snap sets, like that like Sean has. Find I'm sure they're out there. I I didn't look myself, and I'm sure you can find a pattern to make the the hexagonal snap together, attached together dice trays. Dice towers, on the other hand, except for the case where it's something necessary to let you play the game. Uh, take it or leave it. Not for me. I, I don't care. I could see using one for a big dramatic moment, but that's about it. Yeah. I, I One one thing I, I was just thought of, if you have been playing in a, a you know, a game, that D&D that &D game that's been going on for eight years, and you're looking for a gift for your DM, mm. a nice dramatic dice tower could be something the players could all get together and buy. But again, something to buy for yourself, I, I struggle I struggle with that one. They're, they're, a, they're a better gift than they are a purchase for oneself. 
So thinking about using, um, like we had a really long running AD and D campaign that featured the same mercenary company all the time. And we had heraldry that featured Griffins, right? So I'm thinking if that group got together and bought a Griffin dice tray, we would love it for at least one session, maybe two, but then it would end up on the shelf. It would be a knickknack. It would be an awesome thing in the background that looks cool. That would be up there that maybe We'd be like, oh, we're about to fight the bear and bring out the dice tower. <laughs> but like, it, it wouldn't get used, at least my group. All right. Well, that's what we have today for our discussion on dice trays and dice towers. Remember, if you've got a game or game night question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop. Now let's head over to the lobby and see if anyone in our chat room has questions or further suggestions. All right, lobbyists, now that you've heard our thoughts on dice trays and towers, what are your thoughts on these rolling tools? And we've had quite a few here. Uh, we're going to go back to Galabond, who says, I like the hexagonal dice trays that can be unfastened and flattened mm. out at game stores. Dice yep. towers take up a bit too much space for me. In mm -hmm. D&D 5ed, I like using them when I'm playing a thief with sneak attack damage. When you get a critical and have to roll 2d8 plus 6d6 damage, it's nice to have that tray. Okay, I thought he was saying they wiped them for a tower, but he, he likes it to roll it in a dice tray, which is fair. Okay. Though that's one where I might want to use a tower just for the look how many dice I'm rolling. <laughs> Big dramatic, I sneak attack him four. Right. So there is that your aspect. Fire, your fireball damage. You yes, know? exactly. Right. Your fireball damage. Though some dice towers don't handle, there's something we should have mentioned. When you're buying a dice tower, let's see how many dice it'll handle at once. That is one of the disadvantages of these broken token. They are for one die at a time. Like yeah. I said, they have these like mechanics where they drop stuff. Well, some of them, like some are and some aren't, but like there's definitely this one that passes dice between hands and maybe it has a way to funnel them. So only one comes in at once, but it's very much the, what I keep seeing is the bottle cap machines that people are putting in the garages. That's what it reminds me of. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so then we have uh, Angie games. Uh, I like the tray with the corral around the edge that you guys have from easy roller. Yeah. Uh, it's in the background there. It's large, so it does take up some table real estate, but when you are rolling with 14 dice, that takes yeah. up too much space as well. So for those of you here live, this is the one I got from Easy Roller Dice. So it goes together like this. It is PU leather, but like that's not thin. Yeah. And honestly, this is not light. I wouldn't call it heavy, but it's not light. Yeah. So what I love is that this can be your standard big open space dice roller. Yeah. Right. This is great. This is what I use for my metal dice. It just has the pew leather. So it's still a little loud. You get a like sound on yep. it. The dice I have here are wood. So I don't know if they'll make much of a sound. There you go. Yep. You get dice sound. But what I love is this, the two tiered tray where this is actually higher than that. This is meant to be your staging area. So you would put all your dice around the edge. Again, these are, these are dice my daughter, maybe just kind of cool around the edge and then you pass the tray and you grab what you need and you roll them in the middle. Now this is a fairly small rolling area, but it works great for anything we played. Yeah. Like we were, we were up to like 20 dice pools, I think in Sorcerer at one point. And you can tell it's a little quieter than the other, but this isn't going to get damaged. This isn't felt. I don't honestly know what that material is that they use. I, I don't know. And the other thing is this is actually padded. So if you're pushing down on the dice, this is great for like your metal dice or whatever. Yeah. Or heavy dice. So again, yeah. easyrollerdice.com. And it cause I just I dig this. Deanna is a big fan of wolves. Kind of reminded me of Elf Quest. It was a neat pattern. Now, as uh, Galabond also mentions, you're not a real D and D player until you have a crown royal bag for go. every type of dice in the game. Oh jeez. Uh, <laughs> uh, even if you no longer play D and D, Tech mentions you must have a crown royal bag. And Angie Games brings up your Crown Royal bag shelf that is downstairs. Yes. Uh, Crown Royal bags, yes, are the staple of role-playing games for yes. many years now. Many years. It's the most expensive dice bag you'll ever buy, but it comes with some free whiskey. Yep. Uh, and yeah, I'm Kayla, definitely a fan. Major Kayla joined us a little late, but uh, I, Owen, her husband, loves like using his 3D printed dice tower uh, and a gifted R2-D2 one. So if, oh, you, that's you know, cool. if you're a if you're a Star Wars fan, yeah, I can true. definitely yeah. see. Now I think the 3D printed one he has, if I remember, is the spiral staircase one. That I actually have a link, and I will try to find it when I drop it in the show notes to the first person who made it before everyone on Etsy got the STL file and stole it. Right. So I will put a link to the original 
on there and it comes in a variety of colors and that is one of the coolest dice towers i've ever seen though if you listen to the purists it's not a real dice tower because it's just a set of stairs in a spiral and there's no opposing ramp for it to bounce off of so it's not actually random there's actually I, there's actually even some i've seen that are essentially um pipes that are twisted into a and there, there is no stair there are no ramps at all it's a it's okay. a it's a basically a sort of a dna a complex dna sort oh, of thing wow, okay. where things just kind of get caught and roll um and I, again i have no idea no care if it's random but they look gorgeous yeah so 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 sorry owens is actually a tower that folds up oh okay. so it's got like the tray at the bottom as well right yep so the spiral one i i <laughs> that's the one that tempts me the most because it mm -hmm. just looks the neatest and it's in a clear tube so you see the die rolling the whole time right and like i said they're they're available in different colors and stuff like that and there are knockoffs out there i've seen like there i've seen mm -hmm. a really nice cthulhu one that i kind of wanted when we were playing death may die right just because it was this whole Cthulhu thing and you dropped it in his head and it came out in random spots. Those are the ones I like. I like it when there's multiple ways it can come out. I think that's neat. And so I, again, tech, not great for... Tech mentioned, and I think this really kind of sums up a lot of what we're saying about Dice Towers. Dice Towers are just for decoration on the board game shelf. And yeah. so often, that's really what they become. Even if they're really cool and you use them for a couple of games they end up those towers yeah. they're they're pretty that's why most people have bought them yeah. and so they end up as decoration not yeah, that that's a bad thing but no at meeple one actually we had a discussion today looking at them like i'm probably going to keep it up here to put in our podcast backdrops because it's a nice little 3d meeple yeah. but i can't remember the last time i used that as a dice tower and i got that for the first ever will wheaton's international tabletop day held at hugen in munich that was a, it was a, a bonus giveaway. And because I helped organize the event, I got the one dice tower. That was a gift and, from and the store And to be owner. fair, I didn't know you had a dice tower at yeah. all. So, so it shows go. how often it's been used. Yeah. Like <laughs> I, 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 it's I, extra, it, that, that's something we, we, we missed actually when we were talking about both. It's an extra step, Yep. which I, I don't know. It, it takes time. It takes effort. It's, it's an extra step which could make your game nights longer. If you're playing an epic game that's going to take forever, you want your uh, Terraforming Mars doesn't have dice. You want your six-hour game to be at a five-hour game. <laughs> if you remove that extra step of gathering the dice, dropping them and reading them and just throw it on the table, you're actually saving a bit of time every time. Yep. All right. Well, all right. Thanks for uh, all the lobbyists' comments tonight and, uh, and input. Uh... Now I'm going to break the fourth wall. Do I repeat this again? Because I think that's worth keeping in. Yeah, throw it or in. I, already I, can said it. It. I can take out the first time. We take it out the first time and this out, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, if you've got a game or game night question for us, all you got to do is head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Welcome to a review of Magical Kitties Save the Day, a role-playing game the whole family can enjoy. Before we get started, a thank you to Atlas Games for sending us a review copy of the standard edition of this RPG box set. All right, Magical Kitties Save the Day was designed by Matthew J. Hansen and originally published, uh, self-published by him in PDF format by his name, which was a uh, brand Sneak Attack Press. Now, this was back in 2016. Then four years later, in late 2020, the game was picked up by Atlas Games. Now, Atlas kickstarted a new second edition, publishing it both, again, in digital PDF format, but also a print version of the game. Now, this new second edition was also designed by Matthew J. Hansen, but this time other credited designers include Justin Alexander and Michelle Nephew. And there is a list of developers on this that's six or seven big names in the RPG industry. So I say this was a big group effort. It features artwork from Anthony Cordier, Pat, Kat B, sorry, Kat Allman, Akradzina, I, I don't even know, Kazatreva, and Jason Thompson, and I apologize. I actually meant to Google those and look for pronunciations, and I totally forgot. I believe it's show. Ekaterina Kazartseva. Kazartseva, there you go. Actually pronouncing all of the, 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 the consonants this time. So I do apologize, but great looking artwork by these people. Uh, one of the things I found out while doing research for this game is almost every picture of a cat in the game is actually a Kickstarter backer's cat that was put into the artwork, which I thought was really cool. Now, in this Kickstarter, they published both a deluxe and a second 
uh, standard edition of the second edition of Magical Kitties. Um, with all the upgrades that are available in the deluxe edition, for sale now separately. So they weren't Kickstarter exclusive. So you could get the deluxe or you could get the basic. If you got the basic, you could also shop around and pick up the other stuff. Now the deluxe edition sold out in under two weeks. It did not last. Like once it was published, like once they, once the Kickstarter backers got their copies and they released it to the wild, boom, gone. Now in May, 2021, Atlas launched a second Magic Kitty Save the Day Kickstarter called Magic Kitty Save the Day Level Up. Now, this features three new source books for the game, and it's what they're doing to reprint the deluxe edition of the game. No, only the deluxe edition, the standard edition isn't available through this Kickstarter. Now, that funded in less than an hour and a half, so congratulations, Atlas. Now, while I was really, really hoping to check out the deluxe edition, um, I'm the one that reached out to Atlas. I kind of begged them for it. I did get the non-deluxe box set due to the limited availability of the deluxe one. So that's what we're talking about tonight. Um, I do know what comes in the other set, and I will be making some comparisons, but what I physically own is the standard edition of Magical Kitty Save the Day in print. Uh, this box has a very reasonable price of $24.95. That's the MSRP. You may be able to find it for cheaper, and I don't suggest paying more than that since new printings are coming. Uh, upgrading from that non-deluxe set at retail will run you, give or take, about $20 for the cards, plus an additional $15 for each of these source books you might want. From yeah, did you happen set. to catch the, the price on the dice? Because there are also deluxe dice. I did not. Okay, so there are a set of dice. Now, I got to admit, the dice are D6s with kitty paws instead of pips. So you really don't need them, but come on, that's so cute. So Magical Kitty Save the Day is a family-friendly role-playing game where you play magical cats. Every magical kitty has a human, and every human has a problem. It's up to your kitty crew to solve these problems while keeping the fact your magic to a secret so the humans can't find out. The game features a pretty simple D6 dice pool system, and this is a traditional RPG with a GM-player relationship you'd expect, but it does have many modern RPG and narrative game elements added. So uh, the dice and oh uh sorry the dice or the wooden kitty paw treats mm. will set you back 995 of each so 95 yeah. for the dice 995 for the magical kitty paw treats in wood now to get a look at what you get in this rpg box set be sure to check out our magical kitties mm. save the day unboxing video on youtube now you can check that out to see most of it so i'll just summarize a few things overall i was impressed like even with the standard edition, uh, you get two soft cover books in a nice square format, a digest sized comic book that's actually a solo play adventure. There's a fold out pass uh, poster map. There are a nice set of dice, nice pale blue. They're like, I don't know, a cute, friendly color. Like they're, they're welcoming color. And you get a ridiculously thick pad of character sheets and a punch board filled with cardboard kitty treat tokens. Now, while the deluxe wooden tokens and dice with cat paws on them would have been nice, there's nothing actually wrong with the dice that are here or the punch boards or the, like they work. There's nothing wrong with them. You don't need wooden kitty tokens. The cardboard will suffice. As well, you do get the deluxe flocked insert. So oh, if you geez. do upgrade, your components are all well cared for in the box. But it also <laughs> reminds you that you didn't get all those cool components like the decks of cards mm -hmm. that the insert would lovingly cradle if they were there. Yeah, that, that is definitely an issue, and I will be bringing that up in my final thoughts as well. Um, but before I move on, I do want to talk a bit about the rules, um, just because they're striking. Uh, this is, first of all, a full-on traditional RPG with lots of text. Like, this is not a quick read. This is not an eight-page rulebook. Uh, the text is presented in a two-column layout with lots of white space. It's expertly designed. Like, honestly, as I opened it up and was reading it for the first time, I was, like, sharing pictures with Sean and Deanna. Like, look at this book. Like, it just really striking layout um there's great looking artwork there's a ton of call outs tips and examples and what i really liked was the amount of game advice that was how to play and like how you should do things and why you should do things and not just mechanics not just how to play but like how to play well how to how to manage a group how to all, mo very modern things that were missing from our original role-playing games now, what I'd like to do next is a fairly detailed look at the three books you get in the box. Then after that, I'll share my thoughts on the game based on both reading it and running it. This is not just a read review. We have gotten this one to the table. So let's start off with the biggest book, The Rulebook. 
So the rule book for Magical City Save the Day is a soft cover, full color book with a total of 65 pages. Again, not a quick read. Now, it's not broken into chapters. Instead, it's broken into sections. Um, the order of them made pretty much pretty logical sense. Excuse me. I'm going to repeat that because that was gross. <laughs> The book doesn't use chapters. Instead, it's broken into a number of sections which are presented in a pretty logical order. Well, this isn't great for reference during play, having to flip and try to figure out where things are. There is an index on the back cover of the book. So this is a big book. Uh, it's box sized and soft, so not the easiest to hold yeah. and read despite the fantastic layout. Yeah, I do agree. It's, it's, it's a strange, I'm gonna say about 10 by 10, it's probably about the size of the book, which is not a standard format, right? It's not a, a big, normal RPG rule book, nor is it a, a digest size. Now, this book starts by talking about what the game is about and what role-playing is. Um, one of the main things you're going to find throughout all of the books, um, sorry, two of the books, the, in the, the core rules and the City Source book, are kitty tip callouts. These do a great job at explaining why the rules are the way they are, offering additional options, and providing great role-playing tips and even RPG theory talk. Like there's a lot of what I would call modern role-playing advice included here. Talking about things like when not to roll the dice and encouraging you to not roll the dice and just let the players do what they wanna do. A discussion on player knowledge versus character knowledge and bringing that into play in metagaming. When you do need to roll the dice and all kinds of things that involve player input, including the actual resolution mechanic itself. There's even a whole discussion on can you win a role-playing game, which is just great to see. Lots of these modern ideas. So while excellent, excellent to read about and see in a book, in a, in a RPG book, this is going to be advanced for some younger GMs, despite what seems like a game designed with kids in mind. What I do like, though, is if this was your first role-playing game, you're getting that stuff up front. These are the kind of things that have taken us 20, 30 years to learn in role playing. And here it is presented as if it's normal because it is nowadays. And I think that's actually fantastic. Next, we learn how to be a magical kitty, which sets the tone and expectations for all the players. This is an important thing that many role playing games skip. This is what you're meant to do in this game. You are playing magical kitties. You must keep your magic hidden from the humans. You want to help your human. Note that's important. It's like starting a D&D game going, no, you're not evil. You are heroes. You want to be heroes. You want to help your human. That is your goal. That's what we're here to do. You can understand your human, but they can't understand you. And you have like a special spot in your house that humans don't know about that'll let you come and go from your house without being noticed. And it reiterates, you must keep your magic hidden from the humans. So that's an important part of the game. There are a couple more of these kitty rules, but they all kind of follow that same format. Now, before the book gets into any retail, real details of how to play, it tells you to stop right there. Now you know what the game's about. Now you know some overall principles. Go play The Big Adventure. This is a digest-sized comic book that's included, but I'll get back to that after I finish talking about the rule book. It is, we should though, note, though, a much more manageable <laughs> book to hold and read. Yeah, it's, it's that standard digest size, right? It's nice. So the Magical Kitty rule book, Next goes into an example play, and this is honestly the best example play I have seen in any rule book I've ever read. And I have led a lot of RPG rule books because not only it does it walk you through your typical short encounter with fictional players and a fictional DM with little brackets for their character name and the real name. Like I've seen that a hundred times. What this does is as each section of the story unfolds, they use those kitty tips where it explains the rules that were being used, why the GM used that particular rule and how the rule worked. So this like goes for, look, the DM didn't call for a role at this point, and here's why. Oh, the DM did call for a role here, and why? Oh, here, the kitties are going to have to make checks. Here's how they work. And then here, the DM's going to look for success, and because the success was this, this is what happened. That was amazing. Like, that was fantastic. Yeah, it's uh, this part is clearly designed to help players and GMs not mm -hmm. only get more comfortable with the rules, which is really the point of any of these sort of mm -hmm. adventures, but also asking questions and clarifying mm. things. It's one of those things that as, as players, uh, when we were growing up, was never something you did, right? Oh. You, you didn't, no one ever encouraged asking questions or, or trying to figure out why something was done that way. Mm -hmm. If the DM did something, it was because the DM did it. 
Next, we move on to character creation. It's simple. Pick a name for your kitty. You're going to pick a hometown. Uh, hometown's your setting, right? This could be the included setting in the book, which is River City, or something your group makes up on your own. Uh, note the deluxe box set does come with more settings, which are available for sale separately. Uh, there's three of them, Wild Ones, Mars Colony, and Alien Invasion. And now there's a fourth setting that's being included in the current Kickstarter. Now, players are free to describe their kitties how they want and are encouraged to draw a picture of their kitty. There are some stats to be noted down, like your owie limit, your level, and your number of starting kitty treats. Plus, you're going to pick three numbers for your primary attributes. These are where you're going to come up and play all the time. The attributes in this game are cute, cunning, and fierce. One of these starts at three, another at two, and the last one at one. Nothing really unfamiliar to players of most modern RPG games. It's just they've picked cute names for their stats instead yep. of whatever your other game theory might be. And while people may find three stats limiting, you know what it works. Cute is when you're trying to convince people to do things. Cunning is when you're trying to figure things out. And fierce is for physical activity. That pretty all much covers everything. Yep, all you need. Next, you're going to determine your talent, your flaw, and what magical power you have. Now, this is done by either picking off an included list, each of which has 36 entries, which is impressive, or rolling randomly on those lists, or sitting down with your DM and group and making your own. Now, if you own the kitty cards, you could also do this through card draws. Now, what I want to do is just highlight some of them just to give you an idea what this is about. I do go into more detail in the written review, but some talents are night vision, claws, empathic, bargainer, and hunting. Flaws include things like gluttonous, loud, show-off, and careless. And magical powers can be things like flight, laser eyes, burrowing, or time freeze. Now, the last step in character creation is to pick your human. This is another thing of the game, is the kitties always pick the humans, despite what the humans might think. Most details here are left up to you, uh, except for the people's problem. Remember, every human has a problem. Well, it ends up, it's actually many of the people have many problems, more than one. What you're going to do is you are going to determine your problems and assign them ranks. And every human will have four ranks and problems. So this could be one big problem at rank four or four small problems at rank one or anything in between. Now that number, besides giving an indication of how big the problem is, mechanically it's also the number of adventures you'd need to go on to solve that problem. Now there are a couple short random charts for determining what types of problems these are, but the details are really up to you to flesh out. Right, and this is a great way to help craft and shape the adventures mm -hmm. to follow right there within your character creation, which is, again, yes. another one of these, these strong modern gaming mm. uh, ideas where the character creation helps form what comes later. Yeah, literally what you're doing here without them calling that is you are doing shared world building right during character creation. It's not called out the way some games do it, but I think that's good. Again, they're trying to normalize things like that, and I think that's fantastic. Next, we get to actually playing the game. So this is a game that uses a D6 dice pool system. You start by gathering a number of D6s equal to your stat. Again, cute's game for getting people to do what they want. Cunning's for figuring things out and fierce is for fighting. So whichever one applies, you're going to grab one, two, or three D6s. You can then grab a bonus die if your talent applies. Now, again, it's got to narratively apply. You can't just say find some forced way for your talent to apply. And you get two more D6s if you can work your magical power into it. You can lose dice as well from the pool, but only for injuries. So if your kitty's been injured, not just an owie, but actually injured, you'll lose a die from the die pool. The DM then is going to assign a difficulty um, from three to six, easy to extreme. You then roll the die. Each die that meets or beats this difficulty is a success. So on an easy, you have more than a 50% chance per die to succeed. Now, success is a scaled, it, it, it's a, a there's, there's multiple types of success. It's not a win, lose, yes, no, which I like. This is something else. And, inspired by modern games. I'm, I'm personally reminded of Powered by the Apocalypse style games with the success system, though it's not six or under or whatever, but just the, the types of successes you get. So if you rolled zero, you didn't roll higher on any of the dice, you failed. You don't do what you wanted, and there's a complication. One is success, but you do what you wanted to do, but there's a complication. Two is your, your standard. You succeeded. You did what you wanted. No, you need two successes to get the, you got off scot-free. You did exactly what you wanted. Now, if you manage to roll three successes, you get success and. You do what you wanted and you get a bonus. 
Then finally, there's four successes. That's considered a super success. You get to do what you wanted and get a super bonus. Right. And again, we're in familiar territory here. This is very much uh, a, a sort of you know generic dice pool, modern dice pool thing. Not quite as simple as you know rolling two d six and seven plus and ten plus on a PBTA. But it's still got that same sort of improv uh, where, you know, it's no and, yes and, yes and, yes but, no but, yeah. and all that, you know, all these different different levels of success that allow you to play really easily in uh, off of what the role was. Yeah. So these complications, I said you get a complication, you actually get a list, like there's a list of suggested ones. Again, it reminds me of make a move, right? In, in, in the Powered by Apocalypse, make a GM move, right? It's the same idea, sorry, MC move. Um, what you're going to do is you're going to look at this list and pick something. So it could be the thing uses a reaction. So if you're fighting something or you're up against an obstacle, it, they have a list of reactions. So their reaction could happen. You just suffer an owie and owies are kind of like the damage system, right? You could get put into a sticky situation. So you failed and it didn't work and something has, has bogged you down. It could be the inability to act for a period of time. You're knocked down, you get knocked far away, you have to get back, who knows? You could just lose a die from your next die pool. We found that one came up pretty often, right? Like it was just, you know what, you're, you're frustrated. So next time you go to do something. Uh, another one I like is you must do your flaw. So if it applies, the complication could be you're a coward. You have to run away from the fight. I keep saying fight. You know what? The game's really not about fighting. You have to run away from the encounter. You have to run away from the problem. Or if you're a chatterbox, you just don't shut up and you frustrate the person you're talking to. Um, a disaster is created. Disasters, I'll get into more because they're a mechanical thing, but that can be a complication. And the players and GM are encouraged to work together. This is not the GM's job to come up with complications. So if you're rolling for your kitty and you're trying to do something and you fail and you're like, oh, no, what it be would fit really well is if I fail this way, that's totally encouraged in this game. Yeah. And so, again, GM hard moves are yeah. the, the PBTA equivalent. Uh, this is so common. And again, you know, my masks game, I love it when players are like, OK, I've got this awesome thing I want to do and I rolled a two and all. Oh, this would be so awesome if, and I'm like, okay, well, yeah. let's, let's roll with, I'm going to go that, but we're going to twist it a little bit this way because of something I know, you know, that sort of thing, yeah. you know, and it's great to have that back and forth relationship and mm -hmm. not the DM antagonistic relationship. Exactly. Now bonuses are the same deal, right? They're codified. Now these are generally picked by the player and actually literally, except for the one that says make up your own awesome thing that says needs GM approval. The others don't. So the players have full agency here. Now, the GM does get input. And again, you should have that back and forth. But this gives a lot of power to the players. Now, these include things like a fellow kitty gets a bonus on their next die roll. So you, you set them up for success. Or you can, you or a fellow kitty shrug off an owie, right? Like you, you took a small bruise earlier, but now you're so involved with chasing the squirrel that you completely forget about that. And you, you, you've, you've shrugged it off. Or you accomplish a secondary goal. You were trying to catch the squirrel. Not only do you catch the squirrel, you actually happen to tumble and land right near the nuts he was trying to find that you were going to grab him to help with anyway. Or the foe can't cause trouble. This is a great one for trying to incapacitate, say, a bad guy. You, you distract the witch so that you can sneak out the back door with your human. Yeah, and this is it's inter actually interesting. I find that this the GM has input here because in, in a lot of the PBTA games, this is where the GM doesn't actually get much input uh and also often doesn't want the input uh oh, yeah. this is this is that you know the player has succeeded let the player take the take yeah. the mic run with it and 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 do their be their best character yeah it just it's trying to open up that two-way street right it, it, the, the whole game should be a group conversation which is not a term from this game but that that is a modern role-playing term now there are also super bonuses uh these are the same right the, these these are are you get them, you roll really well, and the player's going to get to pick. Now this, like, all kitties get a bonus, or everyone can shrug off an hour, or you can shrug off an injury, or if you're actually fighting or, or trying to distract someone or whatever, they take an extra owie to them. So it's like your critical hit. Right. Now, I've also mentioned kitty treats. Um, these are in-game resource another modern idea that players can earn and spend to do things, like re-roll any die roll in the check, or any or all dice roll, avoid taking injuries, uh, use a magic powers bonus feature, which is something I'm not going to get into detail of, but it's a way to do neat things with your powers. Or 
importantly, add something to the story that it would be beyond your kiddies control. This is another very modern thing where you are giving players narrative control over the universe where they can, yes, there is definitely a chandelier from the ceiling that you can swing off of to get from balcony to balcony or things like that. Now you earn kitty treats by bringing your flaw into play. Now this is important. The flaw has to cause some kind of meaningful consequence to the story. Like being gluttonous and saying, yes, I'm always eating something or we go into the candy store and I steal a treat unless that, candy store owner is going to react it doesn't matter whereas if your gluttonous kitty decides to eat the entire turkey dinner of your human just finished making moments before the mayor knocks on the door now that deserves a kitty treat yeah so these uh, fate points bennies team points whatever meta currency your particular game might have as an equivalent hmm. uh this is pretty much universal going back way into the history of the of role playing yep now, owies and injuries are the health system. Your kitty can take a number of owies before they get really hurt and start taking injuries. If you ever end up with as many injuries as your highest attribute, you're knocked out and you're going to miss the rest of the current scene. But at the end of each scene, this is in session scene, all kitties remove one injury and every kit kitty starts at full health at the start of each episode. Now, no, there is no way for a kitty to die in this game. And honestly, for the most part, death is off the table for Magical Kitty Save the Day, unless it's a story element. Right. If you want to do a story about your humans grieving because someone died, that's completely different. But as far as a result of actions taken in the game, nothing's going to cause death. Enemies can get knocked out. They can give up and run away. They can snub for enough owies to beat them and get them to surrender. No death. And again, this is generally what happens in modern games. We don't want players to leave the adventure and we don't want uh, emotional trauma if you're you're killing off uh Killing off people, period. Yeah, either way, on either side. Now, Magical Kitty Save the Day does have a full, very traditional experience point system where you're going to get a number of points. And at the end of the game, you're going to get points. Now, one of the things they did toss in is a very PBTA style rule, which is every time you fail a check, you get an experience point, which is a rule I completely forgot when I was running the game. So I owe my players a whole bunch of XP. And at the end of the game, you're going to go through a list and you actually ask the table this. Did you save the day? And if everyone thinks they saved the day, you get XP. Did everyone have fun? No, everyone. This is important. If one of the players didn't have fun, no one at the table gets that experience, which I think is a great carrot to encourage everyone to work together and make sure everyone has fun. Did you learn a valuable lesson? I'll note that the adventures didn't seem to be written like um, after school stories. Like they didn't seem to be ham handed about this. So I think this is something that's going to be very dependent on your players. Did you learn a valuable lesson? Well, yeah, actually, we learned this and be like, oh, cool. It's it's not forced like you'd expect from like a Saturday morning cartoon type show. Now, kitties level up when they hit XP amounts. It's very like D&D where like, you know, your first level takes five. Your second level is going to take six XP. The next one actually takes six. Then it takes seven and so on. You spend the XP like it goes away. You wipe it and then start working to the next one. When you do that, you're just going to pick an upgrade. These are right on the character sheets, which is great. And they're broken into tiers. So level two to four, five to seven, nine to 10. Each time you get to pick one though, you can actually pick one from your current tier. So if you're level seven, you can take it from the five to seven, but you can also go back to a previous tier. So you can take something from two to four. These include things like getting a bonus feature. So it's some new way to use your, your magical ability, um, improving an attribute by one. So now your dice pulls get a little bigger. Getting an additional kitty treat at the start of every session, upgrading your owie limit so you can take more owies, gaining new talents, and even at the higher levels, gaining completely new magical abilities. So it, it's interesting. It's a little bit of a meld of older and newer advanced systems mm -hmm. put together, but it does sound like an interesting one. Now, the second half of the rule book includes information mainly for the game master, which they do use the term game master because I know some games don't. Um, there is some great GM advice here with, again, lots of modern sensibilities, when to roll, how to set difficulties. One of the ones I love is what to do when a player tries something silly. This is the, my cat jumps off the roof because all cats land on their foot and how to deal with that, which I'm not going to get into how it describes it. You can discover that on your own. Um, trying actions that obviously won't work. Describing what happens. Another good one, making mistakes and dealing with them. What do you do when you make a mistake as a DM? Uh, various story structures and more. 
Now, there are details here about how to make a hometown as well as how to use the published hometowns. Now, hometowns, which they didn't mention until this point, and I didn't realize until I got to this section of the book, also have problems, which is actually kind of cool. It makes sense. Now, at the start of your series, you are going to pick four ranks of hometown problems, just like you pick human problems. This is followed by a lot of talk on how to handle problems, including how you should start each episode, each session by choosing a hometown problem and aiming it at one of the kitties' human problems. And then there's talks about taking your various problems and making alliances between them. And then things for when problems no longer are problems anymore. And this really reminds me of the front system from PBTA renamed and told in a different way. And I gotta say this part of the book, made me start to really feel like this is not actually a kid's game. It is a game you can play with kids, but like, like the rules for creating and playing kitties are simple, easy to grasp. I, I would say you could probably easily play with a, like a five or a six year old, possibly even younger. As long as they can count the numbers on the pips and compare them to a number you said, you're good to go. You probably play with a younger kid if you roll dice for them. But once you get to this DM section here, this is some pretty high level stuff. Like these are not the kind of things I'm used to seeing in a gateway role-playing game. And I could see a beginner GM being completely confused and overwhelmed by what's here. Now, early in the book, it does suggest that an adult, older sibling, or babysitter be the GM when playing with kids. But it wasn't until I actually got to this section that I saw why they thought an adult should be running it. Yeah, and again, so this is great for first-time players, and we, we know that uh, we'll, we'll talk more about it later, but your family did have fun playing this. Yes. But this is not something to take lightly as a GM. This is not necessarily uh, something you want to enter into lightly. So even if it is going to be your first game, and it, and it may well be, you want to really take your time yeah. and, and prepare carefully for it. Yeah, and I would still say, like, there is some DM advice here I wish I had learned in my first game. Like, there is some great stuff here. But just that the, the fronts and problems and how they, sorry, the, the problems and how they <laughs> interact just was a step above. So once you hopefully figured out this problem system, the game then gets into creating adventures. And this is a really, again, high level, more than you'd expect from what seems like a simple game. But it gives you a number of really solid, what they call adventure recipes that are basically what I would call story beats, or if I'm talking Robin Laws, right? Different things you want to hit during your session. It doesn't use that terminology. That's my terminology or Robin's terminology. And these include a, a number of different ones, like the boss rush, the five scenes, a simple mystery, the raid, and the rescue operation. Each of these basically give you a formula that you fill with problems, foes, challenges, role-playing elements, and more. So for example, the five scene recipe, you're going to start off with the first threat, then it's going to move to the puzzle, then the role playing, then the trick or double cross, and then you get to the big finale. And we won't get into a discussion of, <laughs> of whether or not to include puzzles in RPGs this episode. I would like to refer to Gaming and BS for some great episodes on that topic. <laughs> yeah, the puzzle here may not be a solve a physical puzzle. And to be honest, the way the game is written, you are going to use cunning for most things. Like you're, you're, you're not going to necessarily rely on player knowledge. You're going to, that's why those player stats are there. There's the, I'm going to try to solve the puzzle. And because I'm in too inquisitive, I actually have already previously researched this back at the library. So I get my bonus. It's more of that kind of thing than actually handing the group a puzzle to solve. Though that could be a great learning moment if you are trying to add some uh, teaching moments to your games. Now, the final section of the book gives you details of the foes and disasters that you can slot into these recipes. Now, it even notes these recipes are great once you learn them for improv -ing. Personally, I found that structure approach a little odd, but again, I'm coming from a very traditional uh, Marvel superheroes to Shadow or to Cyberpunk to Warhammer with a bit of D&D mixed in their background. So it's just not the way I think of DM adventures. But they're saying like, once you learn these, you can just throw them up. Like, oh, the players want to go over here? No problem. That sounds like it's going to be a raid, which is you're trying to raid a building and get in to get a thing. So what this is, is all the stuff you need to fill in those gaps. So you have foes. They have their own sets of stats but then they're done used differently, right? This is, this is another one of those games and no powered by Apocalypse didn't do it first started with uh, the fate system from TSR is the DM doesn't roll any dice. They, they do not interact with the randomizers. It's all on the players. So what these stats actually are, are the target numbers the kitties roll against when facing the foe. So if a witch has a four cunning, that means trying to use cunning on the witch needs a four. 
Now, foes have owie limits, no injuries, though. If you hit the foes owie limit, they're defeated in some appropriate way. Now, the neat bit here, and I've seen this in Dungeon World, I don't know what other games it might be from, is the foes have reactions. These are what that foe does when you need a complication. So these are tools the DM can use when the players fail to check. So if you're looking for a complication, you can look, and all foes have three of them. There are all kinds of different foes um, presented from the mundane, other kitties, various humans, squirrels, and guard dogs, to the fantastic, which is hyper-intelligent raccoons and aliens. I, I want to know what hyper-intelligent raccoons aren't mundane. They need to see the <laughs> ones around my neighborhood. Uh, and, and hard <laughs> moves are what uh, I would call that for, as a masks player. Uh, okay. So every, every villain I, I, I develop or that you find in a book has got a certain number of hard moves that are the, the, actions, that, are the actions that they perform okay. when a uh, role gets missed. Yeah, so there you go. Same same type. Of, I knew it was a, a modern RPG thing, but I love having that as a DM, being able to focus on the game and not worry about dice and just having this quick list of, okay, you failed. What happens? And I look and I'm like, oh, you're fighting a, uh, a magical book. Well, it could cause paper cuts or it could just close up and pretend it's a normal book or it could fly away. And if you don't catch it and I'm like, oh, that's so I want to have that happen. Or I could go to the whole list as the other ones normally. Now, disasters represent natural or supernatural events. These actually usually come into play through a consequence. So somewhere where someone gets a failure or a partial success, you can bring a, a disaster in. So if you're sitting there trying to run away from the witch and you fail, you might knock over a candle and start a disaster like a fire. Now, each disaster features a number of reactions. These are neat because these can be used for consequences for anything during the scene. Not just when dealing with the fire, right? The room's on fire. Yes, you're trying to put out the fire. You're going to use the fire reactions. But if you're still trying to escape from the witch and ignoring the fire, you still could get burned. I thought that was a really smart way to use this system. Like an example is the earthquake has the reactions. Debris, everyone takes an owie in the room or in the area. Crumbling walls, an exit is closed off. Or blackout the causes power to fail in the area and you're stuck in a black room. Now, the last couple pages of the rule book, I know this is a long one, big book, as we said, though not nothing compared to the, some 300, 900 page tomes. But for again, for an intro game, this is a significant book. Uh, you get a glossary of words. Why is this in the back of the book? Like, like I, I read my books from cover to cover. There's stuff here I would have liked to have known before. But anyway, minor complaint. And then there's a GM worksheet in the back. You can photocopy, which does anyone photocopy? You can also download it from atlas.games or atlasgames.com. Uh, this is to keep track of the kitties and the problems. And I got to say, this thing wasn't very useful. But more about that when I get to my final thoughts. So the GM worksheet sounds like the same sort of thing that I've seen in the back of every PBTA game I've ever uh, seen. <laughs> and I've never used one myself, there but go. they're always there. So that was just the rule book. Yeah. There's still two more books to get through. How about you tell us about the comic book? All right, again, uh, bear with me, right? Because that rule book is the biggest thing in the box. Uh, it's the book with the most pages and the most stuff to learn and talk about. So these other two are not going to take nearly as long to cover. So the next one is the comic book. It's, it's a digest-sized, full-color comic book, only 34 pages long. And as I mentioned earlier, right near the start of the rule book, it's going to direct you to stop reading and go play this. And it makes perfect sense. It's, a, it's an adventure. Uh, it's presented in a choose your own adventure style format that has you flipping all over the book. And I got to say flipping and flipping and flipping. Uh, there's a lot of flipping needed to get to the end of the story. Uh, it tells the story of a single kitty looking for the human's favorite toy that's gone missing and has been lost. Early clues lead them to check out a mansion that's rumored to be haunted. Now, the book does a great job of slowly teaching you the basics of how to play Magical Kitty Save the Day, uh, walking you through making a sample character using, uh, like, there's only three powers to choose from, and there's only eight talents and eight flaws, but it gives you the basics. Um, it also gets into the basis of rolling the dice without getting into the details of complications and bonuses. The story features lots of different paths and really shows off how you can use your kitty powers in a variety of ways and presents multiple options for dealing with the obstacles. And I gotta say, anyone who's going to play Magical Kitties, play through this book. Like, don't just skip it. It's, it's worth going through. All right, well, that just leaves the hometown setting source book, River City. All right, this is another soft cover book, but this is the same size as the rule book, right? That 10 by 10. Uh, this is only 35 pages long. Now, River City is very much small town USA. 
uh, featuring the things you'd expect in small town USA. And this is very much USA as a Canadian. There's definitely stuff there that I haven't seen, but every, you know, after school special Hallmark TV show or uh, WandaVision has shown me just what small town USA should look like. That's what you got here. You've got a busy waterway that the town was built on, a beautiful town square where people like to gather with a statue in the middle and shops all around, a single big Carnegie style library, and of course, a huge chemical plant that everyone kind of hates but tolerates because it's the biggest employer in the city. There's even a local game store in the town square. Now, along with this, though, are some fantastic elements, like the fact Baba Yaga has just moved into town, the Queen of the Frost Giants is staying at the hotel, and there's an old castle up on the hill that's been there as long as anyone can remember, plus a house in the suburbs that changes color every day. Now, along with the book, you do get a poster-sized map of River City that features all these interesting locations with a like a zoom in on the town square. And for those of you not watching, the map is a nice clear really good quality map uh, of mm -hmm. large size for a table now a very large number of river city problems are next presented in the book and as mentioned earlier your hometown only has four ranks of problems at a time as you solve problems yes you're meant to add new ones to keep the game going right otherwise your campaign's going to end but i was shocked to find nine different fully detailed problems presented in this book of ranks from one to four including multiple fours now, these problems include uh, the aforementioned Baba Yaga, uh, problems at the chemical plant, obviously, uh, the toy maker, the mice resistance, neighborhood burglars, and more. Now, each problem is described in detail, which is broken out by a problem's agenda, what it's trying to happen, like what the, the mice resistant are trying to accomplish, and a set of adventure ingredients that are basically prompts for ways to tie each of these problems into their own ongoing story. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the actual way you're supposed to design an adventure is to pick one of these and aim it at your human. So you have the mice resistance trying to do a thing. Well, how can I involve one of the cat's humans in what the mice resistance is doing to get the players involved? That's that whole aim a problem at a problem thing that might be hard to grasp. And they, they certainly help out the GM while at the same time not making it easy mm. for the GM to handle all of these various complexities that need to be managed in a, a uh, system yeah. of this level of complexity. But now remember, though, you're only going to have four ranks of problems. So for a first GM, pick one that's rank four. Then you only have one thing you have to focus on. So it's weird. Like I said, they present way more than I thought. I thought there would be, here's four ranks of problems that are happening in River City. Go. No, here's nine all over the place. Now, after problem, you get into details about locations. Um, some locations I haven't met, mentioned yet are the Clock Tower, Danbury's Antique Shop, the Mermaid Fountain, the Montgomery Hotel, Hawthorne Beach, the Cliff Size Hospital, Dewberry Park, and more. Um, each of these, again, uh, in, they're broken up into neighborhoods, and each neighborhood will have more adventure ingredients, so ways to tie those places into your adventures. Then we get to supporting cast. This is filled with a number of important River City characters. Um, note these aren't all humans, but the human cast members, instead of having adventure hooks, have listed their human problems and a total of four ranks. So I thought this was cool because what this lets you do is you can use these Azure Kitties humans. So you have pre-built humans that you could use that will tie into this existing setting. And there's even a random chart so you can roll it up to see randomly which of your Kitty's Humans is one of these important people in River City. And with my group, one of the three players did end up going with a random uh, NPC off this list. Right, it's always nice to be able to hook your characters into the world, the pre-built world, directly mm -hmm. like this, as just a, that, that one extra step, less step for the GM mm -hmm. to have to worry about building from scratch. The other thing I like, too, is it also gives you an option for younger players where they don't have to come up with a human, because that is a pure... Whatever you want, what your human want. Like, if you're not comfortable with improv and telling stories, though, honestly, the younger kids are usually better at that than some <laughs> us older kids. So after the cast, we get foes. Uh, these are adversaries for you to face. This has a number of new foes that aren't in the main rule book. Uh, there's fey folk, a number of dinosaurs. Why do you need dinosaurs in small town USA? Uh, scrap pixies and the Mulgrim. You've got five new River City specific disasters that are presented, which include a blizzard, magical mist, and whitewater rapids. So certainly no shortage of content to play with, even with just the one book you get in yeah. the basic box set. 
now this book does finish off with an adventure. Um, it is Magical Kitties Save the Library. This is a 13-page adventure split over four scenes. Uh, the scenes are in a logical order, but can actually happen. Like scene one has to happen, but after that, it can go in any order. Uh, this is designed first off as a way to get your kitty crew together because it has a number of humans going missing. So if your group's brand new and you don't want to come up with a backstory of why are you working together, here you go. Here's your, your there no beating in a tavern here, but here's your way to get the group together. All your humans are gone missing. You're all going to investigate the library together. Now, the format of this adventure is kind of strange. It, it's just not what you expect. Like it, it, it's kind of old school mixed with new school. So you got the location descriptions. You got talk all about foes and their agendas and what's going to happen if the kitties don't interfere. But then you've got like old school callbacks, like box tests to read, but not enough to give a full description. Like it, it's it's strange. The thing I found even more strange is there are no gameplay mechanics or stats or what to roll or difficulty levels listed in this adventure. Sorry, there's a couple difficulty levels for like two things. But in general, the mechanics have been stripped out. Um, there were also a number of things that instead of giving you details on just said check page this and River City book and even some other stuff that's like check the main rule book. Now, I get it. I, I think I, I don't know if they had a hard 35 page limit here or what. The fact the last page of the adventure is literally on the back inside cover might indicate that. But like I get not wanting to repeat information in more than one spot. But this would be so much more usable, especially for a new GM, if everything was just there. Like, come on, D&D &D has been putting mon smaller monster stats in their adventure blocks since 1970 something. Like, I, I find it really weird that the stuff you need to run the adventure isn't in the adventure. So due to this, I have a feeling not many GMs, new or old, are going to be able to run this on the spot. Like, just pick it up. We've all read it. We've made our kitties. Let's play. And you've never read the adventure before. Ooh, that's going to be a mess. Like, unless your players are willing to put up with a lot of flipping through three, well, two different books during the game, you're probably going to need to do some prep work. And this is just an odd callback to older style games where read through prep was absolutely expected mm. of the GM with any new adventure you were going to be playing. Uh, yet otherwise it's such a modern storytelling game that it's, it's a strange uh, balance yeah. to see. I, I thought it was very strange. Now the story itself is very entertaining. Uh, it's very enjoyable. It's very whimsical. I think it's probably the best word I could use to describe it. It does a great job of showing off the mixing of the mundane and the magical, which is of course a big theme in magical kitties. You probably picked up. Um, the other thing that Deanna pointed out to me is there are a lot of things the kids won't get and the adults will. And this particular adventure which I think is great to see uh, there, but there are a ton of NPCs to track in this. I, I should have brought my notes up here so I could hold up my, my list of just one specific type of NPC. I think there's nine of them. And these are NPCs with their own motivations and their own personality types and the way they talk. And I found I literally had to make a list of notes before playing to be able to keep track of who's who and their personalities and where you find them. And even doing this, I still was flipping through the books while we played because there were things I just forgot to note down or stuff I thought would have been in the adventure that weren't. One of the things I will note is there are NPCs that insist they are always called by their full name. Well, the full names are in a different section than their stat block. So maybe you should have used that GM reference sheet. I <laughs> uh, No, not for this. The GM reference sheet is for managing your overall town problems and your humans, not for a specific adventure. So it, it's more of an over, overall sheet that, again, we'll get back to. <laughs> Uh, now, while my family did enjoy the adventure, um, to be honest, we haven't quite finished it yet because it took a very long time to play through. Now, I, I don't remember where I got this in the rulebook. Somewhere in there, it notes that a usual session of Magical Kitties would be an hour or two, which makes sense for a, a kid's game. After four hours of play, we only managed to get through three of four scenes in this included story. And that's not going to count like the hour of Deanna had to make a character and the kids wanted to play through the comic book thing. Um, like, I almost wonder if they expected you to play one scene an evening to get that two hour of time frame. But then if you did that, that wouldn't that doesn't fit with the XP system. Like, it just doesn't work that way. 
Now, it's also possible that my particular family spends way more than the usual amount of time describing their actions. Um, my kids like to get very verbose and very detailed about exactly how they do a thing. And they do like interacting with the NPCs, especially Gigi really like to just hang out with the NPCs she liked. I am really curious, and I haven't seen this in another review yet, is how long did this ta venture take? So if you play Magical Kitties, I want to know, how long did it take you to play through this library adventure? Fans of the show will note that your kids do love to embrace the world <laughs> of their games and embellish delightfully. Yeah. Now, so that's all the books. You've obviously read them all and actually run the game for your mm -hmm. family. What are your final thoughts on Magical <laughs> Keys Save the Day? All right. So when I first heard about this game, I just needed it. I had to get this. Like, like come on magical cats trying to solve humans problems without getting caught that just sounds awesome like i was the one that reached out to atlas this was one where i was like oh atlas games i saw your magical kitty kickstarter i didn't say i'm broke but i'm like hey i'd be really interested in reviewing this once production copies are out would, would that be cool that would be awesome and they're like i don't know here review breakdancing meeples and i'm like all right sure which would be a fun game check out my breakdancing meeples like, so we did a couple reviews for them and i think they're just trying to test the waters and make sure that we actually produce the content we said we're going to produce so eventually it shows up i didn't even know it was coming just boom hey i got this box set and i was all excited and unfortunately due to the fact the deluxe edition was doing so well and sold out in two weeks which is great for Atlas, it wasn't great for me because they sent me the standard edition. Now, I will say, despite only having the standard edition, I'm still really impressed by this game. It does a lot of things right. I think it's a fantastic game for playing with kids. And I think this theme, like we keep talking about this as a kid's game, kids this, kids that. This is not a game just for kids. I know plenty of adults that would have a fantastic time playing this game with no kids in sight. And I'm not even talking like beer and pretzel drinking game. I know adults that would love to play Magical Kitties. I think there is a, 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 a enough meat here to keep gamers of all experience levels interested. It isn't just a kid's game. It's just a youthful theme. And the mechanics are simple enough that kids could rock. Now, that said, I do want to point out a couple complaints. Um, these are specifically because I got the standard edition. And again, I'm not blaming Atlas. It sucks, but I get it, right? If they can sell them, why would they send out a review copy for a game they're sold out on? They don't need it reviewed. It's sold out, right? I get it. So the first thing I mentioned a bit above is the fact that both, I, sorry, I didn't mention, I mentioned it in the full review, uh, or as you see in the unboxing, both versions of the game come with the same box insert. And this makes sense, right? For cost and production standpoint, I get it, but I couldn't help feel like my game was incomplete seeing that insert for the first time. Seeing four empty wells for holding cards just taught the fact I don't have cards right in my face. And then the lack of cards leads me to the next complaint. This one I think is more serious. The rule book, at least sections of it, were obviously written assuming you have the deluxe edition. There is a section near the start of the book when it's talking about making your kitty and drawing a picture of your kitty that says, great way to get inspiration for your kitties is to look through the cards, each of which features a different breed of cat. Then later in the same section, it says, hey, if you're playing with kids, one of the great ways to, to help them get into the game is to deal them out four of each of the magic power cards, talents, and flaws, so you limit their options so they're not looking at like a huge list. Both of these are great suggestions. They make perfect sense, but only if you actually have the cards. So, which, as we noted earlier, are a $20 add-on. So to have the rules less than subtly suggest that you should have these cards is somewhat frustrating to say the least yeah and if it had said worded it like a later in the book it words it if you happen to have the cards here's a great way you can do this i would have been perfectly fine it was the now just grab your deck of cards and do this what deck of cards come on that was frustrating now on a more positive note uh even without the dark deluxe upgrades i basically said this at the top of the review the components you do get are great quality is great the writing's clear and concise the artwork's fabulous everything you need to play is here you've got character sheets kitty tokens dice the adventure the rules uh, all you really need to play this is some players and something to write with uh sorry red meeple ryan no included pencils in this particular copy that would have been cool nice car oh, that would have been a deluxe upgrade anyway uh rule books well written uh it makes sense it's in logical order um the instruction i i the system that 
read the first part of the book, go play the big adventure, then come back, work really well. Like it's a great way to onboard the game. And we all really enjoyed playing through the comic book. It was fun. Everyone in the family did it. Some of us did it more than once to try out different powers. Yeah, no, the call outs in the books are also a really helpful mm. feature along the way. They really thought a lot about the process of people playing through the game and questions that mm -hmm. arise. Now, the rules, of course, Magical Key Save the Day are very simple. Um, they remind me of Mermaid Adventures. So if you check out my review of that kid's game on the blog or YouTube, you'll see how both games have a dice pool that you build the same way, right? You find there's three attributes. You find the attribute that's applicable. You take that many dice. If you've got an applicable skill, power, or talent, you take more dice and you roll them. Now, Magical City Saves the Day takes things a step further. In, in Mermaid Adventures, they opposed roles, and you're looking at just rolling over four or not. This is a little bit more complex with a more modern system, especially with the degrees of success and including an in-game resource that can be spent with the, the kitty tokens that can be used to mitigate randomness and affect the story. So it, it's definitely a step above that, but the dice pool is very similar. And what I really dig are these modern touches. This is what I appreciate most about Magical Kitty Save the Day. Things like including the players when determining results of checks. Uh, a very detailed complication and bonus mechanic that drives the story. It's made to drive the story forward. This is very much a fail forward. Complications do not mean bad things. And it's very clear on the fact that you always have a, don't roll if your complication is the story stops or you can't get through the door. The other thing I would do though to improve on this is to include the bonus, super bonus and complication list right on the character sheet. Because the character sheets are great and they have all the rules of the game. They have a full rule summary on the back, but they skip these charts, which is weird because these charts are things the players pick off of. So I was a little frustrated by that. Like when we played, I actually told the player, well, flip over your sheet and do this. And like, there's nothing here. And I'm like, what? Why wouldn't they put that on the sheet? That's the thing you're going to pick through the most often. So definitely worth making, uh, probably making your own reference card mm -hmm. to have on the table and, and you'll pass around when someone's making a roll. Yeah, I agree. Something, something like that would be really useful. Now, one modern take in here that I'm not too sure about was that whole problem system, right? The, the, the whole DM is meant to use this structured system for adventure design. And again, it's, it's fronts from Apocalypse World or other clocks or other things from PDA, PBTA games that I'll admit, I have a hard time wrapping my head around fronts. So I guess it makes sense that I'm having an issue with it here. The whole concept of picking a hometown problem, pointing it at a human problem, possibly having your problems align to make things more interesting. Like I just found this kind of confusing. And this is from someone who's run RPGs for over 30 years. I worry someone new to DMing a game for the first time is going to find this even more overwhelming than I am. Or maybe not. Maybe the problem is that I have been running games for 30 years and I'm old and stuck in my ways and I just think games should run in this logical pattern and they don't. So maybe this concept would be really easy to grasp if I didn't have a preconceived notion of how to create adventures. Well, I, I have to say from my point of view, I think it, I may actually be you. Uh, I fair. haven't found the concept too tricky, but I was always a player and not a GM until mm -hmm. recently with modern RPGs. So I came into it thinking about that overarching bad and how to link that into each player as I developed my masks game. And it came rather naturally to me personally. And, and again, this may be me and, and it still could be difficult for other people, but as someone who didn't do the, go through the, the GM hoops that you have over the years, right. uh, I didn't have that, that change of, uh, idea necessary all right speaking of gming the game we're finally going to get to it so the one thing the game provides to help out that i found almost useless is the gm adventure reference in the back of the rule book i don't know who made this like, like it almost feels like a joke because i don't think anyone ever should use this as it's written because it gives you more room to write a single digit for your stat than it does to fit in your kitty's human and their problems. It is literally a smaller box than one they give you to write a one digit number. Like, like no one, like I, I, I one point font wouldn't fit any of my players problems in that little box. Now I haven't seen this, but it sounds like it could be something who's that's been made by a graphic designer instead of a GM. I don't know. It, it honestly is one of the most useless things I've seen in a role playing game, except for maybe inspiration to make your own. 
Now, as for actually using all this stuff at the game table and actually playing, my kids had a great time just making their kitties. Um, this is a game where they just want to keep making kitties. And I remember that, just spending time making characters. They loved looking over the River City map and looking for Easter eggs and small details. Like they caught that there's a game store with a D20 shaped sign in the town square and thought that was awesome. And well, the proof is in the pudding. If the kids are enjoying the game, the players are enjoying it. That's the biggest selling point yeah. right there. Yeah, I decided to start off our game with the the included adventure, right? The one in the River City book. And I, again, it was a mixed bag. Like not just reading it, its layout. Like it is a, an interesting story, uh, but it's just not written in a way you can sit down and read it and run it from the book. Like instead of providing a step-by-step walkthrough, which is what I expect in a, in a beginner box. Note this doesn't say beginner box, but it's the only box there is. So to me, it's, a, it's, it's your intro to Magical Kitties. It throws you right in. Like, like, here you go. Here's a full adventure. Go. It's, and it just assumes you've already mastered and internalized all the rules, which is evident in the way the story is presented and the lack of any game mechanics listed in the adventure. Like to run this as well as I did, I had to take time to prep before the game. I had to write down stats. I had to note some probable paths I thought my players would take. I made a ton of NPC personality notes and more. Well, I don't mind a little prep now and then, it's just not something I expect from what seems like a very light game and from what amounts to your starter first adventure. And even with all this prep work, I was still flipping through the books. Yeah, th- this is the shocking part of this game to me, because one of the main features of many modern RPGs is the lack of prep mm. needed by the GM due to the cooperative nature of the game. Uh, but I guess because they're at least allowing for that possibility of the the younger less experienced players they're they're backloading onto the gm some perhaps uh, perhaps like i said I'm not, I'm not sure i'm just not used to it like you said i i was used to it so this is one of the things where i i have grown up and learned new ways to play like this is not a sit down at the table and play to discover what happens it is not that type of modern story game this is a You finish your adventure, you now, there's a whole math thing here where you adjust the problem levels, and then the DM, before the next sitting, is going to have to sit there, look at those newly adjusted problems, find one of the city problems, do that whole aim the problem at a human, and come up with a story. This isn't the kind of thing where you're just, like, possibly you might have some prompts for when the last story ended, where the kitties might want to go next, but, like, there's no just, all right, we're sitting down, let's go. Like, I'm sure with enough experience you could get there, but uh, just starting off? No, I don't think so. Like, I, I honestly, this is not the easiest game I've sat down to run for the first time. Like, I think I did a good enough job as my family had a blast playing the game. Uh, we found the system worked well, like really well. The dice pool system, the degrees of success system, um, the complications and bonuses, the narrative control the players had. My kids love that. They loved having the, the additional power, uh, especially compared to playing traditional games like Dungeons and Dragons. As a GM, I loved the retaliation rules for the foes and and, and the disasters. And I liked the, the improv tools it gave me, the ability to the, the, the complications weren't oh you take an alley it wasn't always oh you failed take an alley or oh you failed get minus one there, were, there was a wide range to choose from yeah no it's interesting i mean they've used so many great modern tools like hard move tables or hard move lists and things like that to allow you to mix it up and use this dice pool system mm-hmm. in a very modern way uh and then and then gone with a a not linear adventure but no definitely not actually but, but uh, you know, more, more, uh, again, you know, that, that front loaded adventure that's put weight on the DM. Yeah, it definitely puts weight on the DM. Uh, well, it's not an adversarial game. The DM's going to have to do the extra work. And plus, as I mentioned before, this, this simple adventure is not short. Like I, I was expecting a quick one shot, not a multiple session story that I'm going to have to return to days later. Uh, while we're enjoying it and i don't mind breaking it up it's just not what i expected reading the rules i was expecting the short session and to be honest it kind of disrupted our plans we're like we're gonna start playing at this time and then we're gonna have dinner and we're gonna do this and no we started playing and just kept playing and kept playing and dinner was late and we didn't get done some stuff we were supposed to do which was actually kind of fun to do because we haven't done that that often where we you know waste time gaming now 
I will admit there are some improvements I'd like to see. Um, for one, that GM Adventure Tracker give me something I can actually use. Um, put the resolution charts on the character sheets because you gave them everything else. Um, one of the big ones that players asked for is some way to mark if you have a plus one or minus one die pool. So again, one of the bonuses is get plus one on your next roll. And one of the uh, super bonus, everyone gets plus one. And one of the possible complications is minus one from your next roll. This is not a game where you're rolling dice constantly. Like it very much pushes the let the players do what they want and it succeeds unless something interesting will happen if it doesn't. And while so you don't roll, it's it's not like a combat in D and D where you're going to roll your D twenty thirty times. Like I, I didn't count how often we rolled dice, but what would happen was a extended period of time would happen between getting that bonus and being able to use it, and the characters, the players would forget they have it on both sides, like both to help them with pluses and minuses. I like. I, I'd like some way to track that even like writing on a character sheet, just not memorable enough. So either like, I don't know, I'm going to steal some plus one minus one tokens from magic gathering sets or something. But I saying that there's honestly nothing I would pull out of the game. There was nothing I thought didn't work again. I had a little eh, hard time kind of wrapping my head around the problems, but it works. Like it's, it's, it's their way of doing things different the way I think that's a thing. Every game does things different. I wouldn't pull that out in any way. And to be honest, I find plus one forwards in masks really difficult to track myself. Yeah, that's see? that's a common issue I've run into as well. But the one thing to remember about this is make sure you're prepared. If you're going to be the GM for the game, it take the time and, and really spend the time in advance. And as a result, it should be a fun time for all involved. Yeah. So overall, there's a ton to love in Magical Kitty Save Today. This is a fantastic traditional RPG, not only great for new players and kids, at least on the player side, not necessarily the GM side, but it also features a number of modern RPG sensibilities that are integrated very well into the system and presented in a this is normal kind of way that I really appreciate. Now, if the concept of playing magical cats who work together to solve problems for their humans and helping out their neighborhood sounds fun to you, and how could it not, you should pick up this game. Well, I personally only got to check out the standard edition. I will say if you can get it, I do strongly recommend spending the extra money for the deluxe edition. Besides getting some nicer components, you actually get three more full setting books, which I think also have adventures in them. You're getting three decks of cards. And some of these components are things that I actually think would help during play. For example, one of the cards is your magic power. Well, you're only allowed to use it once a scene. Well, it's really easy to flip that over. When we were playing last night, sometimes we are we still in the same scene? Are we not that I use my power? Well, that's right. I used it. So like it actually is going to enhance the gameplay. Put it this way. I own the standard adventure. Uh, it's right there behind me. And I am still really strongly considering picking up the deluxe adventure just for those additional components. So that's all we've got to say for Magical Kitties Save the Day. For an even more detailed look at this family-friendly RPG box set, be sure to check out the written review over on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we've played since last episode. Right, of course, the most exciting thing that happened this past week is that I got the, the entire family together and we played it. Magical Kitty Save the Day. Uh, it felt good running a role-playing game again. Like, since the pandemic hit, I have now run two games. That's it. Uh, one for, for some of our Patreon patrons over Discord, and now this. I, unless you count D&D Adventure Begins. So, I, I, nah, it's board game slash RPG. I don't think so, because it's shared. So, it was just cool. I, I felt good to be running games again. Uh, my kids both love the game and the system. Um, the kids have officially stated... We never had to play Mermaid Adventures again. <laughs> and the more impressive one, and I actually like this, is they've now lost interest in trying out D&D. Why would they play that? Like, we can play Magical Kitties. d and is complicated, and there's there's way too many roles and too much math. Um, I, I, this may actually turn into an ongoing thing. Um, I could perhaps figure out how this problem system works, uh, especially getting to do multiple sessions and play with the numbers changing and stuff like that ongoing family role-playing games that's just awesome how can you yeah. go wrong 
one of the things I might do is um, I don't know how we, if we can fit it in the schedule, like Sundays, we do RPGs is getting um, grace to run my little ponies and Gigi has, okay, here's where she wants memory event. She wants to run her own game. So she's asked to borrow it. Maybe get her to run mermaid adventures and then we can rotate. So we play all of them. Now, the other thing I got to the table this past week, finally, is the Aventuria Adventure Card Game. Uh, this was sent to us by Ulysses Spiel. Excuse me. This was sent to us by Ulysses Spiel quite a ways back. Uh, I managed to get through all the rules pretty quickly. Uh, surprisingly short rule set, actually. Uh, this was the most easy to understand adventure card game I've read and played. Like this beats out the Warhammer adventure card game, the Pathfinder adventure card game, and other fantasy dungeon crawl style card games. It's just much more streamlined, simpler system. Which is interesting because I think we were pretty overwhelmed by the amount of stuff and the different cards and, and all the different bits and, 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 and mm. things when you, when you looked at the boxes and what, what came in them. It was a lot to take in and I think we yeah. were a little nervous about what it was going to be like. Oh, exactly. And that, that is exactly how I felt. I, and I'll let you know if that changed once I get some descriptions here. So, so one of the things we got, uh, again, it's behind me here, is a small box called the Master Taylor's Poltergeist, which is meant as a demo kit. It's specifically designed for teaching the game. And this includes rules for both the player versus player dueling game, which is one way to play. I say player versus player. It's actually like, like competitive because you can play up to four players. It's not necessarily two player only. And a cooperative adventure game. And I guess this just makes sense, right? Like, why wouldn't I start learning the game from the demo kit? Plus, uh, to be honest, let me kill two birds with one stone because now I'm getting to review both at once. So I am going to save the full description of this demo kit for the review. But it basically provides you with a simplified player deck that's the big component that's in the big box is these rather thick i can't remember 40 or 30 card long decks and instead they're only 18 card decks and a very short simple adventure as well as some rules for fighting out of duel so we ended up trying out both ways of playing uh using the demo kit we started with a duel which i gotta say is interesting um this game is about generating endurance to get your cards into play but once they're there they're just there they're there for the rest of the game which is very different than many of the other dueling card games. And at some point, you might get to the point where everything you need or want is already up. Like you've done it. You, you're, you're fully equipped. You're good to go. Or your deck runs out. Now, like especially with the demo deck, your deck is literally only five different cards. The rest of the cards to remove some decision making and what you have to think about just instantly turn into endurance for you. Again, I don't want to get into the full rules, but it simplifies it by going here. There's no thought. You get an endurance every round. You don't have to think about it. So you actually have five different cards and it's possible you'll get them all into play. And even more possible, you're going to run out of draw cards, which isn't a bad thing in this game. You just keep playing. And this was just so different. The Pathfinder Adventure card game is all about managing your hand in your deck. If your deck runs out, you die. Or the tableau building where you're putting out monsters and you're attacking other monsters and they die and they come and go. The stuff we've seen in Sorcerer, Star Realms, and Magic Gathering is nothing like either of those. This is a duel all about equipping your character for the fight and defeating the opponent before they defeat you. Now, the combat system feels like a role-playing game. Like, it really does. Now, it's going to mess up everyone who's North American used to D&D because &D you're trying to roll under instead of over. But besides that, you're rolling D20s. You're rolling D6s for damage. Um, it, it's pretty simple. You're making attack rolls, and you're rolling to dodge and stuff like that. And you get armor that reduces damage. It's kind of it, It's basically a full RPG combat system simplified. And as expected from a, damage, a demo game, these are lightning quick. Like, like they were... I, it was over very quickly between the two of us. And I am now really looking forward to playing one with a full 40 health and a full deck of cards and actually having to decide which equipment I want to burn to use as endurance. Cause that is not part of this. Yeah. That's, that's going to be the, the real interesting part is, is when endurance becomes something that you don't just have as its yes. own card. Uh, but again, it's interesting to see how RPG like, yeah. Unlike unlike a lot of the adventure card games, this one really leans heavy more heavily towards the RPG style. No, I agree. It also reminds me for uh, fans of collectible card games other than Magic, the old Warlord collectible card game. It reminds me a lot of that. Well, the dual system, as different as what it was from what we used to, wasn't fun enough, was cool. But what I really wanted to try was the cooperative adventure mode. And it did not disappoint at all. 
Uh, the demo adventure, if you watch our unboxing video, which goes live Monday, which will be live at the time this episode comes out, just is really neat. It's very whimsical. It tells a great story. Um, now it features one exploration style check before moving quickly to a combat. So it's pretty simple. Here's an out of combat check. Here's the combat. The combat is fun to play through. It showcases the unique story system in Adventuria, which involves um, both a time tracker. So you put a card out and you put a number of tokens on it. And, and where every round a token goes off and there'll be certain set intervals, something happens. That felt very RPG-like. Uh, random henchmen, so you develop a henchman deck who may come and go. And then a very neat system that tosses in non-combat elements that are involved in the fight. This is done by putting out a special card that gives players an option to make some kind of skill check to do things other than fighting the henchmen that are out there. Now, I'll say more, but I don't want to spoil this demo at all, so I'm not going to say more, just in case anyone plays with it. What I will say is the goal of every combat in Adventure is to defeat the lieutenant. There is none at the start of the combat. Well, that's certainly an interesting twist when you, you don't even, I mean, imagine going on uh, Lord of the Rings adventure and not knowing that you know you're going to beat Shalob at the end of the fight if yeah. you win, you know. <sighs> So I thought that was cool. I overall, I, I'm impressed. I, I really am. Like this is a very elegant system. It seems to be much more focused on story than mechanics. It's more simple to learn and quite fun to play. Now at this point, all I've done is two demo games, both using the demo deck. So maybe my thoughts will change over time. I should say my thought, our thoughts, Deanna kind of felt the same. Now, the one thing that did change, which Sean kind of brought up is my excitement about digging deeper into this game and the mountains of expansion content that's out there. Like for those of you who joined us live for our live show, when I opened the box from Ulysses Spiel, and I was just like pulling out box over box over box, I, I, I was filled with dread. I'm like, how am I going to get through with this? And I literally had to write um, like someone there going, what, what do I start with? Where, where do I start? Like, I, I didn't even know what, like, yeah, okay, there's this one core box. Is that where I start? Or is there something better here? Like, I was just overwhelmed. And I got to say, all that's gone. I can't wait to dig through some of these boxes and see what else is in here and what kind of stories we can tell and what new heroes we can try. Yeah, no, this is, uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, to seeing this and, and whether or not I, I, I only get to play a duel because you guys are too deep into the adventures for me no. to jump in. Uh, despite being an ongoing campaign, what it does is you can play at multiple difficulty levels. So I've read ahead, right? So the first sample adventure uh, is much more involved. There's, there's multiple encounters. There might even be multiple combats. I'm not sure. But when you beat it, you all get one XP. And then XP is used in a certain way. Again, I'm not going to get into all that. We didn't obviously do that with the demo. Then you have the option to play it through at a higher level. You can never replay one you've beaten. And you can never go down in level. You can always play a higher level. But if D and I go through that first starter adventure, you come down. Well, you can just join us and play it on the next difficulty level. The other thing is, well, there is progression. You gain XP. You level up. Your character gets better. There is nothing insisting your players stay together. Hmm. Now, you might want to experience the various stories. I don't know yet. Again, we've only played the demo. So I don't know if the stories are linked in the book or if they're completely standalone. Now, the demo is definitely completely standalone. So I thought this has got to actually got to go high on the Excel's list of Sean. It, it's got to go close to Eclipse and possibly just below Eclipse. Now, just to show how, how good this game is. And I, after our talk about Rail Pass, this isn't going to be as striking as I think it should be. But <laughs> the one thing I want to point out here is after our games of Adventuria, this is a quote from Deanna. And I said, so what do you think? What do you, what do you think of the game so far? It's like, well, versus play is okay, but I'd much rather play co-op. And I was just like, did you just say what I think you said? Why didn't I have my phone on record? <laughs> yeah, words you don't expect to hear from Angie Games. Yes. All right, well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? All right, so two big things I want to do gaming this week. Uh, I want to finish off Magical Kitty, save the day. We got we got a whole scene, uh, a whole chapter, a whole, I'm thinking of the word, wrong word. Is it a scene? Whatever. We're, we have We have the conclusion of the big library adventure with the like nine different books with their own personality types. Um, I, I definitely want to do that. And the second is to play Venturia with the full decks uh, specifically to try one duel. We'll probably only do one duel and one duel only because that's not what we're interested in and try the full adventures. There are three, I think it's either three or four. There's one big one. That's like three chapter story. And I think there's two small, like, 
single session kind of things. So I'm really looking forward to trying those. Um, if we can get that done, I'll try to get up a full review of, of the Adventuria core box and possibly do a two, two review episode and also talk about the Poltergeist Ghosts. The other thing is I did this amusing thing the other day where the kids were busy and we have um, a bunch of magnets on our fridge that are letters and the kids like to leave messages on them. I shared a couple on Twitter before that were pretty good. Well, the day I was going to run Magical Kitties, I put something like want to play Magical Kitties. Sure enough, that got them excited. Well, the other day I went by it and it said, can we please play Disney Villainous? And I don't know what kid put it there, but you know what? If the kids want to play a game, I'm going to want to play a game with them. So I'm happy to oblige that. But I'm sure right now there's no way they're going to play that if they can play Magical Kitties first. <laughs> Uh, excellent. And I'm, this week has, has killed me. I even actually ended up uh, canceling my session for, oh, uh, for masks on, on the on the weekend because I was just burnt out getting ready for this. So hopefully uh, in the coming weeks that will change and we can go back to, uh, you know, I can at least go back to having uh, one game a week or two games a week of, mm -hmm. uh, of masks. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Welcome to the latest Tabletop Bellhop patron, Courtney Jackson. We have reserved a seat at the table for you, Courtney. Mac, Lick, Matt Lichtenwaller. Thanks, Matt. Roger Blosh and his growing list of games to play with Mo. You're not the only one, Sean. Thanks, Roger. Zopi, thank you. Brian Sheehan, um, haven't seen Brian on the Discord for a while. He was usually pretty active. I hope everything's okay, Brian. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit the website at tabletopbellhop.com, find our podcast on your podcatcher of choice, and sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. Uh, also, please consider tipping your bellhops at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us, and be sure to stick around and join us in the Pendo Suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.